Broom with a View. See which Cozy Mysteries Book 2. Written by Morgana Best. Narrated by Amy Soakes. Chapter 1. Persnickel and I shared a love of five-inch stilettos. The only problem was I loved to wear them, while he loved to eat them. I awoke in my new house in Queensland after crashing fully clothed on the lumpy bed, only to find Persnickel, who was a wombat and my familiar, nibbling on one heel of the most expensive shoes I'd ever bought. Get off! I shooed Persnickel away. I almost called him a little devil, but then I remembered the devil likes to wear Prada, not chew it. I struggled out of bed, grumbling, and said good morning to the great love of my life, my coffee machine. Persnickel, satisfied he'd chewed all he could chew, softly snored in the background as I made my first cup of the day. As I drank, I tried not to think about Thomas, my ex-boyfriend. Not only had he cheated on me, but he didn't even have the good grace to grow a humpback and catch some horrible disease that made his skin go all purple, like all terrible ex-boyfriends should. It was the only decent thing to do. After one cup of coffee, things were starting to look a little brighter. At least I had slept in a bed the previous night, rather than in the tent of the night before. And who would have thought that only the previous day I had tripped over a dead body and a woman had tried to poison me? And I had been told small country towns were boring. I was a little on edge, so I made another coffee. The unpacked boxes that had arrived the previous day were piled high, and I figured it would take me a while to adjust to my new life in a small beachside town with a population of around 2,000. The week before, I had been living in a tiny apartment in a trendy inner-city Melbourne suburb. I sighed. So much had happened in that time. I had caught Thomas, who also happened to be my boss, with Alexis, a real estate agent he had promoted over me. Thomas had promptly sent me to run his real estate office in Southport on the Gold Coast in Queensland. The very same day, I discovered I had inherited the house in which I now was, on the condition that I live with a roommate for one year. I had bought the shoes as soon as I discovered all this. I don't think anyone could blame me. The roommate turned out to be Persnickel, a wombat who, as my familiar, enabled me to see and communicate with ghosts. The house was in a small town on the ocean and was in a northern, and I mean northern, suburb of the Gold Coast. I sipped my coffee and counted myself lucky that I had a whole month off before I had to start work in Southport. If only my uncle had left me enough money to start my own business. The house was a bit of a mess, what with all the boxes stacked in every available corner, but it was mine. I had never owned a house before, and I had always loved the photos of the old Queenslander houses I had seen online. I just wasn't so sure about the poisonous cane toads and the giant pythons that were said to live in this part of Queensland. I looked at Persnickel again. Oleander had left me a huge printout of do's and don'ts for the care of wombats. On the top, in capitals, it said that wombats sleep most of the day. That suited me fine. Although I wasn't a people person, far preferring the company of animals, I was pleased that I had made a ready friend in Oleander. She and her close friend Athanasius lived at the nearby retirement home. No sooner had I turned on the fan and the air conditioning and leant back to rest my eyes than my mobile phone woke me. I looked at the screen. Oleander, I was just thinking about you. I hesitated and then looked at the time. It was nine already? I must have been tired. Goldie, she said urgently, there's been a death at the retirement home. I'm so sorry, I said. It must be hard for you, but given that everyone there is around the age of 100, I assume it happens from time to time. Still, I'm sure it doesn't make it any easier. I had no idea of the right words to say on such an occasion. You don't understand, she began, but I interrupted her. I said the wrong thing, didn't I? You don't understand, she said again. It was murder, and they think I did it. Chapter 2 
I hurried out the door as fast as I could, but not before I slipped on my four-inch stilettos. I bought this pair in New York City when Thomas had flown me there. We'd gone ice skating at the Rockefeller Center. I let myself wonder if he would take a Lexus over there, but only for a minute or two. I wasn't about to wallow in misery, at least not while I was sober. Dashing to the car, I hoped Oleander had provided me with good directions to the retirement home. I figured it wouldn't be too hard to find, given that the town had a population of fewer than 2,000 people. Still, I was surprised when I found it. So far, all the buildings I had seen in this town, apart from the Queenslanders, were either ramshackle and in desperate need of repair, or were modern and glossy. I had expected the retirement home to be dire, but it looked quite fancy. The dry stone walls of the entrance gave way to an avenue of vivid purple jacarandas, and the lawns were well manicured. The buildings themselves, there were five in total, each more beautiful than the last, were brick and covered in romantic ivy vines, like something out of a movie. I imagined a man scaling the vines to whisper sweet nothings into the ear of the girl he loved, but then I remembered the ages of the people who lived in these buildings and knew there was no scaling going on. Oleander had told me to park in the main parking area, and I drove past two police vehicles as I did so. I had expected Oleander to meet me at the entrance, but as there was no sign of her, I headed for the front door. The reception area was modern and inviting, although there was no receptionist at the desk. I saw a nurse talking to a police officer, so I hung back. When the police officer walked down the corridor, I hurried over to the nurse. Hi, I'm Goldie Bloom. I'm a friend of Oleander Blanche's. She called me and asked me to come over. The woman frowned deeply. Oh, yes, the police just finished questioning her. She was here a moment ago. She was about to say more when a young man strode into the room. He was tall and broad, with bright red hair and brown eyes and smelt of sandalwood and vanilla. He gave the impression of being strong yet understanding, and for a moment I forgot all about the murder, because I was imagining us on a beach somewhere. Hello, Dr. Swan, this is... But the nurse did not get a chance to finish her sentence. Call me Henry, he said, offering me a freckled hand. And who might you be? I'm Golden, I spluttered. Goldie, I mean, I am Goldie. I tried to shake the image of Henry massaging my shoulders as I sipped a pina colada. It was then that Oleander burst into the room. Her white hair was standing out in all directions, and her eyes were puffy and red. She took me by the arm. Let's speak in the garden. Henry, I said as a goodbye. He saluted. Oleander all but dragged me outside. I don't want anyone to overhear us, she said. She led me around the side of the building to a covered area, quite a beautiful courtyard, nicely paved and with tables and chairs under shade. Various potted plants lined the terraced area. I recognised the plants as golden cane palms, which were tall and dense and shielded us from any lurking nurses. Oleander opened her mouth, but then burst into tears. I patted her back awkwardly. You said someone was murdered, I prompted her followed by, can I get you a glass of water or something? Coffee, she whispered. The police said I'm free to go for the moment. Can we go to your place? Yes, sure. I'll drop you back here later. I knew she wasn't suggesting going to a cafe for the bizarre reason that it was illegal to serve coffee or even consume it in East Buckleberry due to an ancient bylaw. I owned a plumbed-in coffee machine. That was the reason I had already proven immensely popular with some of the folks from the retirement home, and I had been here less than two days. Oleander did not speak again until we were inside my house. Persnickel was still fast asleep, snoring gently. He had not moved from his spot. I had the urge to blow a raspberry on his lovely warm wombat belly, but I doubt Persnickel would have enjoyed that. Also, somebody had just been murdered. My friend was the lead suspect, and I was under-caffeinated, so there were more important things at hand than annoying my new fuzzy roommate. I'll make some coffee, and then you can tell me all about it, 
I said, in what I hoped was a sympathetic tone. I remembered Oleander's preference for a cappuccino from the previous day. I was good at remembering which coffee people liked. It was very important, after all. Soon the two of us were sitting in my living room on my uncle's old sofas, which were lumpy and smelt a little off. My own sofa was against the wall where the removalists had left it, and given that it was modern and only a two-seater, it looked out of place. Oleander wrung her hands. The victim was the residence manager, an absolutely horrible woman by the name of Ursula Hackles. They found her this morning. She was dead, she added somewhat unnecessarily. And why do the police suspect you? I asked her. Oleander sniffled into a tissue. I had the most terrible argument with her last night, she admitted. Lots of people saw us. I'm sure the police don't really suspect you, I said doubtfully. You would just be the most obvious suspect. I regretted the words as soon as they were out of my mouth, but it was too late to take them back now. What does Athanasius think about it? Basically what you said, she said. But you didn't hear the way the police were questioning me. By the time they finished with me, I was almost convinced that I did it. I waved a hand at her in dismissal. Look, you, Athanasius, and I are all witches. Surely we can stop the police arresting you somehow, especially since you didn't do it. I paused and then added, Do you have any idea who did do it? She shook her head without hesitation. So there aren't any other suspects? She shook her head once more. To the contrary, there are too many suspects. Probably anyone at the retirement home would have had a motive. Ursula Hackles wasn't well liked. Do you remember Harriet Hemsworth? Of course. I had met Harriet, and Oleander and Athanasius for that matter, the previous day. Harriet had been sitting next to me when an unpleasant young woman by the name of Laura had tried to poison me. Laura had informed me that if someone kills a sea witch, then they get the sea witch's powers. I had two powers. Firstly, I could speak with ghosts, but only if Purse Nickel was with me. And secondly, I could affect the weather, such as causing thunderstorms when I was upset. I had no idea how to control that, though. Maybe I had other powers as well, but I wasn't aware what they could be. I had only just found out I was a sea witch, after all. My mind went back to the matter of Harriet. What about her? Poor Harriet is lactose intolerant, but that nasty woman put milk powder in her instant potatoes. I held up a hand. Hang on a moment. None of this is clear. By the nasty woman, I take it you mean the victim, Ursula Hackles? She nodded. I pushed on. So she was a cook. I thought she was some sort of manager. Oleander nodded slowly. She was the residence manager. That meant she was pretty much in charge of everything. The food, the nursing staff, everything. She was the one who told the kitchen what they could serve the residents. Apparently she noticed the confused look on my face, so she explained. The retirement home has two sections, the assisted living and the independent living. Athanasius and I are in the independent living section, and Harriet usually is too. She injured her back recently, and so had to go into the assisted care facility. She seemed perfectly fine when she was driving the bus yesterday, I pointed out. Oleander drained the rest of her cup before looking up at me. Yes, she was back in the independent living a week ago. We have our own units, fully self-contained, you know, kitchen, bathroom, living room, bedroom. But the residents in the assisted care section each have one bedroom with an ensuite bathroom. All their meals are provided for them. Poor Harriet got so sick after the first time she ate dinner there that she realised the food had milk in it. That was despite the fact she had clearly written on her menu that she was lactose intolerant. Surely that was a mistake, I protested. May I have another coffee, please, was her only response. I stood up and headed for the kitchen, with Oleander hard on my heels. Oleander talked while I was frothing the milk, despite the fact I signalled to her that I couldn't hear over the humming of the machine. 
After I handed her the cappuccino, we went back into the living room. Sorry, I didn't hear anything that you said. I forgot what we were talking about anyway. I was telling you that it wasn't a mistake, she said. Ursula Hackles was a terrible cheapskate. She didn't serve real potatoes or pumpkin. It was instant potatoes as well as instant pumpkin, and I'm sure Ursula Hackles added milk to them. Poor Harriet was so sick the first night, and after that Athanasius and I had to take in meals for her. I was horrified. Why, that's simply appalling, I exclaimed. Lots of people are lactose intolerant. Surely they don't all get those disgusting meals. I had the urge to arm myself with proper food and storm the retirement home, wielding a breadstick as a weapon while I dispensed proper meals to the poor old dears who were imprisoned, sorry, who were living there. They do, she said. They would just have to eat the other things, like the partly cooked beans and the other horrible stuff they serve. Harriet said she had a piece of stale raisin toast for breakfast, and when she asked for lactose-free margarine, they gave her butter. Luckily, she did get some tiny pieces of fruit as well. But aren't these places regulated? I asked. I assume they are, but the food in the assisted living section is dreadful. I realised I didn't even know how the victim was dispatched. How was she murdered? Oleander shrugged. I have no idea. Who found her? I assume it was one of the nurses. Ursula Hackles, as the residence manager, lives, oh, I mean lived, in an apartment at the retirement home. Perhaps one of the nurses went looking for her when she didn't show for work. I really don't know the details. And you said other people didn't like her. Was it all because of the food? Oleander shook her head. Everyone hated her. Let me think. There's Julie Medina, the clinical care coordinator. She's a very nice woman, but Ursula Hackles had her on warning. I don't know what she did wrong exactly, but I do know her job was very important to her. She lives with her mother, who is quite ill, but her mother grew up in East Bulkleberry and refuses to leave town. So her mother isn't at the retirement home? I asked her. No, Julie cares for her at home. I can't see what other job Julie could get in a town as small as this, so if she loses her job, she would be between a rock and a hard place. I can't see Julie murdering anyone, but then again, someone did murder Ursula Hackles. Can you think of any other reason why someone would want to murder her? Oleander shook her head. Come now, I put a reassuring hand on her arm. You can tell me. I'm here to help you, you know. Oleander mumbled into her coffee. I couldn't quite hear her. Say again? I said Ursula Hackles took things. What kind of things? Possessions. Photographs. Blankets. Balls of yarn. To punish someone, she would take something of theirs and then lock it in a storage room. She carried this awful set of keys that always jangled at her hip to remind people to stay in line. I winced. That's awful. Oleander nodded. As I was thinking it over, Persnickel wandered into the room. He was making a strange sound, something akin to grunting. He's hungry, Oleander said. I'll show you where his food is. She had already shown me the previous day, but I decided not to point that out. I followed her into the kitchen, where she put some special wombat food into a dish and placed it on the floor. Don't we need to let him outside for a bathroom break? I asked her. He has a dog door, she said, pointing to the kitchen door. I did a double take. I wondered why I hadn't noticed the dog door when I had been locked out on my arrival in town. Oleander did not have a chance to respond because her phone rang. She hurried back into the living room and fished her phone out of her giant handbag. When she finished the conversation, her face was white. The police want me to come down to the station to make a statement, she said, trembling. Would that be Detective Grayson? I asked. A rather irritating man, Detective Max Grayson was nevertheless strikingly attractive in a rugged sort of way, unlike my newly ex-boyfriend, Thomas, who was attractive in a pretty boy sort of way. Apart from Henry, 
Grayson was the only eye candy in the whole of East Buckleberry, as far as I knew. He was insufferable, although his jawline was amazing. No, they were all uniformed officers this morning, she said. I assume I will be questioned by detectives. There was no sign of Max Grayson. Should I drive you to the police station? I offered, all my thoughts of a slow and peaceful day unpacking and setting up the house, flying out the window. Yes, please, she said. Goldie, I know these cops are going to try to hang this murder on me. Clara Swan told me as much this morning. I tried to process this new piece of information. Who is this Clara Swan? Her son is Dr. Henry Swan. You were talking to him earlier. He's the one with red hair? Pina Colada's on the beach guy. I remember. Clara Swan was some sort of career criminal back in the day. Now she's well over 90, but her mind is as sharp as a tack. She said I was going down for this crime. There's only one thing for it, Goldie. I didn't like the way she said it. I had a horrible feeling it was going to involve me. What, what is it? I stammered. You're going to have to take Purse Nickel to the retirement home so you can ask Ursula Hackle's ghost who murdered her. Chapter 3 Oleander and I were sitting in the waiting room in what I had been told was the closest police station to East Buckleberry. It had been over an hour's drive, and I was grateful for my GPS. Still, I had taken a wrong turn onto the M1 and had nearly ended up in Brisbane. The police station looked as though it had been built in the 1980s. The floors were of a pale cream linoleum, which I thought a strange colour choice for a high traffic area, but then again it didn't appear to be too dirty. The sliding doors were framed in brass with black grills on top of them. The reception area looked as if it had been upgraded in more recent times, its chocolate-brown bench seemed to be the colour of the moment, and its ivory countertop was possibly a failed attempt to match the colour of the floors. The faint scent of pine disinfectant and sweat hung in the air. The reason I was looking around at the decor was that I was exceptionally bored. We had been here a while, and no one had as yet summoned Oleander. I wondered if that was designed to intimidate her. If it was designed to do so, then it was certainly working. She twisted and turned in her seat and wrung her hands at intervals. I leant across and was about to say something to her when she spoke. There's no one else in the waiting room. Do you think I'm their only suspect? I shook my head. Of course not. I tried to think of something reassuring to say. They know about you because you had the argument with the victim and I'm sure some police officers are at the retirement home right now, finding out all the people who had reason to kill her. Her face lit up marginally. I hope you're right. I hoped I was right too, partly because I knew Oleander wasn't guilty, but also because I did not want to take Persnickel to the retirement home. If another suspect showed up, then I figured I was off the hook. After what seemed an age, a tall young man emerged and introduced himself as Detective Sergeant Walters. He escorted a clearly unwilling Oleander down the corridor, leaving me in a worse state of boredom. I wasn't bored for long, because a handcuffed man burst through the door, accompanied by two police officers who were doing their best to hold on to him. They managed to get him down the corridor, only with some difficulty. After they disappeared, I was once more bored, so I logged onto a national real estate website on my phone. Five or so minutes later, I heard footsteps approaching and looked up to see Detective Max Grayson. I realised I was looking too pleased to see him, so I schooled my face into a more neutral expression. Goldie, he said. I thought he, too, looked pleased to see me, but that might have just been my imagination. What are you doing here? he asked me. Oleander Blanche from the retirement home is being questioned. Right now, I told him. He frowned and then put the large cardboard box on the seat beside me. Oh, yes. The murder last night of Ursula Hackles. Why are they questioning Oleander? 
Without responding to his question, I asked one of my own. Aren't you working on this case? Something flashed across his face, and he said, No. I shrugged. Apparently, Oleander had a terrible argument with the victim last night. She's worried that she's the only suspect. He bit his lip and was silent for a few moments before answering. I see, was all he said. Do you think the police think Oleander did it? I asked in alarm. I figured they were only asking her because of the argument, and then they'll find more suspects later. He continued to frown. Yes, that seems likely. He nodded to me and then hurried out of the building. I had only met him for the first time the previous day, but his demeanour today was entirely different. I wondered what was going on with him. Then again, maybe it was nothing. After all, I hardly knew the man, but he did seem rather harassed. Nothing else eventful happened at the police station, and it was a good half hour before Oleander reappeared. She was still shaken. She hurried over to me and grabbed my arm. Goldie, let's get out of here. She all but pulled me to the door. Do you want to go for coffee? Or do you want me to take you straight back to the retirement home? Let's have coffee, please, she said in a trembling voice. I can fill you in on what happened. I can't face going back there right now. Any preferences for a cafe? I asked her. You know the area. I don't know this suburb at all, she said. Let's go to the first cafe we find. I'm feeling quite shaken. Fortunately, there was a little cafe just down the road from the police station. It was bright, airy and modern and filled with plenty of natural light. You go and find us a table and I'll order. I told her. What would you like besides coffee? Maybe a cake? I'm in need of something more substantial, if that's all right. I'd kill for some air-fried potato chips, she said, and then slapped her hand over her mouth. Luckily, the police didn't overhear me say that. I forced a smile. Cake as well? She shook her head. I ordered some air-fried chips for myself, too. I was trying to lose weight, but I consoled myself with the thought that they weren't deep fried, simply air fried, and that sounded like it had a lot less calories. Besides, potatoes were vegetables, so they had to be good for me. That's what I told myself anyway. The man behind the cash register said he would have our coffees with us soon, but the air fried potato chips would take five minutes. I paid, and then found Oleander. She was sitting bolt upright at a table and chair set, rather than the deep, plush sofas on the far wall where I preferred to be sitting. Still, I could see she was in no fit state to take any recommendations. They said the coffee would be right with us, but the air-fried chips would be about five minutes. I put the number on the table in front of her. What did the police say? She put her head in her hands for a few moments before speaking. It was awful. I really wanted to confess just to make them stop asking me questions. They asked me the same thing over and over again. They must have thought I was lying. Or oh, why were they trying to trick me like that? I shook my head and patted her hand quickly. I'm sure that's routine. I watch a lot of cop shows like NCIS, Murdoch Mysteries and Midsummer Murders, and they often ask people the same thing over and over again. It's just routine. I did my best to sound reassuring. I really had no idea, to be honest. They asked me what the argument was about, and I told them. It dawned on me that I didn't know what the argument was about, so I asked her. I was complaining about the milk powder for people who need lactose-free food, she told me. I was complaining about poor Harriet being so sick with the food. In fact, I was complaining about the food in general. And I can tell you it didn't go over well. Ursula Hackles took it as a personal insult. And is that all the police asked you? I asked her. You had to give them a word-by-word -word description of the argument? She nodded. Pretty much. A waiter deposited our steaming mugs of coffee in front of us and informed us that our chips weren't far away. We thanked him and Oleander continued. They also asked me if I knew anyone else who had any reason to harm her, if she had any enemies. Why, that's fantastic news, I exclaimed. See, 
That means they don't suspect you and they were looking for other suspects. Oleander looked doubtful. I suppose. Anyway, I gave them a long list of people who didn't like her. I told them what happened with Harriet. Not that I wanted to implicate Harriet, mind you. And I told them about Clara Swan, who has a criminal past, and... What exactly was Clara's criminal past? I asked her. Was she a murderer or something? Oleander shrugged one shoulder. Nothing like that. Not as far as I know. I don't even know if she personally was a criminal, but her husband was a Mr. Big of a huge drug syndicate here in Queensland for many years. His name was Ignatius. Ignatius Swan. No doubt you've heard of him. I shook my head. No, I haven't heard of him. But then again, I lived in Victoria, so I didn't know much about crime this far north. Henry's father was a crime lord, I said silently. Sixty Minutes did a story on him, though, she protested. I don't really watch Sixty Minutes, I told her. She seemed disappointed. Oh, well, it was quite some years ago. You're probably too young to remember it. Probably, I said. And what other suspects were there? There is Julie Medina, the clinical care coordinator. I told you about her before. And then pretty much anyone who was living in the assisted care section on that disgusting food. My goodness me, Goldie, the fees they charge for living there. You'd think they'd produce decent food for the inmates. I laughed. Aren't they residents, not inmates? It sounds like they're in jail. She pulled her face. They might as well be. Poor... She let loose a string of words. Goodness me, Oleanta. I lived in Melbourne for years and didn't hear language like that. Her face flushed red. I'm sorry. Have you ever heard the expression, words that make a sailor blush? I nodded. She pushed on. You're a sea witch, so you should be used to words sailors would use. I did not understand her logic at all. But then she was working herself up into quite a state. Thankfully, the air-fried potato chips arrived just at that moment. I popped one into my mouth and smiled with delight. They were lovely and soft in the middle, but crispy on the outside and absolutely lathered with salt. Luckily, I didn't have high blood pressure. The air-fried potato chips seemed to cheer up Oleander as well. I should try to calm down, she announced. Getting worked up about it won't help me. I wonder if I should find a good lawyer. I shook my head. No, Oleander, I'm sure you won't need a lawyer. I'm sure they won't arrest you. Having an argument with the victim the night before is simply circumstantial evidence. She reached across to me. You weren't in the interview room, Goldie. I'll be surprised if they don't arrest me. It was very intimidating. I was sure she was right. I was certain that being interviewed by police was intimidating for anybody, but it didn't mean that they were going to arrest her. You have to help me, Goldie, she continued. Promise me you'll help me. I nodded. I've already said I'll help you. She popped another chip into her mouth. After she had eaten it, she said, We have to find out exactly what killed her. And how do we do that? Hopefully the general gossip will tell us, because... She suddenly stopped speaking and held her fingers to her lips. I followed her gaze and saw the young man I had seen come to interview her and another man walk in the door. They walked straight to the counter to order. They're the two detectives who interviewed me, she whispered. Just after they ordered, Detective Grayson walked in. He no longer had his big cardboard box with him. He, too, ordered briefly, so I figured he was only ordering coffee. I wondered if he would see us and come over. We were close enough to the counter to hear snatches of conversation. I think I heard them mention that Detective Grayson was on leave, I whispered to Oleander. Did you hear that? She nodded. My hearing is as good as it ever was, and I'm certain that's what they said. But what's going on, Goldie? He wasn't on leave yesterday. What has happened overnight? I shrugged. I had thought he was different today. Something was going on with him, but what? Chapter 4
I had slept fitfully the previous night, but there had been no word from Oleander. I again woke up at five in the morning, once more surprised at how light it was at that time of day. I looked at the unpacked boxes and groaned. I thought I had hardly any possessions, but I had a lot more than I realised. I supposed everybody who moves house finds they have a lot more possessions than they ever realised they owned. At least I had the essentials out, and today I intended to finish all the unpacking. After all, I didn't start my new job for a month, and I wanted to enjoy my free time once the house was the way I wanted it. I was on my second cup of coffee when the phone rang. It was only six in the morning, so my stomach churned. No one calls at six in the morning with good news. I sprinted back into my bedroom, where I had left my phone, and picked it up. I looked at the caller ID, Oleander. What's wrong? I said by way of greeting. The police questioned me again last night. Her voice was trembling. What? You had to go back to the police station? There was silence and I imagined her shaking her head. Finally she spoke. No, they called me and said they had found codeine in my bedroom when they searched my room. I didn't want to call you late last night and wake you up. I interrupted her. You didn't tell me that they searched your room. She seemed surprised. Didn't I? I was sure I told you that. Yes, they searched my room yesterday morning. I struggled to put the pieces together. It was early in the morning, but the caffeine was helping. Okay, the codeine. Is that how Ursula Hackles was killed? Was she given a huge amount of codeine by any chance? I still don't have a clue, Oleander said. You know, Goldie, someone is trying to frame me for her murder. Why do you say that? She made a huffing sound. Because I don't take codeine. I've never taken codeine. Even when I've had the flu, I've only ever taken Panadol. I saw the codeine in my bedroom drawer that morning, right after I came back from my morning walk. I wondered how it got there, because I certainly hadn't put it there. I was going to ask someone, but then we all heard that Ursula Hackles had been murdered. I told the police that, and I told them that I had touched the packet. So if she was killed by codeine, then someone put it in my room and they're trying to frame me for it. From what she had told me, I was coming to the same conclusion. Do you have any idea who it could be? No, but we're going to have to find out before I'm arrested. Think about it, Goldie. It's not looking good for me. I'm the one who had an argument with her the night before she died, and then the police found a large amount of codeine in my room. I tapped my chin. But if you killed her, you wouldn't be silly enough to leave the evidence in your bedroom. Surely they'd realise that. That's what I told them, she said. But most people underestimate the elderly. They think we're all a pack of doddering old fools. I'm sure they think I murdered her and I was silly enough to leave the codeine in my bedroom. That's not good at all, I said, and then regretted the words as soon as they left my mouth. What can we do about it? I added hastily. Athanasius and I think you need to bring in Persnickel so you can speak to Ursula Hackle's ghost. I'm sure you haven't forgotten that you can speak to ghosts in the presence of your familiar. How could I forget? I found that out only the day before yesterday, I told her. But Oleander, you know I can't go marching into the retirement home with a wombat. It's probably against a whole bunch of health regulations. We'll just pretend that he's a therapy dog. Therapy dogs come to the retirement home all the time. It won't be any trouble at all. I did not share her enthusiasm. A wombat looks nothing like a therapy dog, I said, wondering if I could be arrested for such a thing or simply forcibly kicked out of the retirement home. It will be no trouble at all, Goldie. You wait and see. I know the woman who brings in one of the therapy dogs, and I know where the spare therapy dog harnesses are kept. Harnesses? I echoed. I don't know what you call it, she said. It's something that goes over the dog's back like a blanket, and it has the words therapy dog written on it. Oh, great, that will disguise the fact that he is a wombat and not a dog. 
I said sarcastically. Exactly. Her tone was full of glee. Bring him in at ten, and I'll meet you at the gate with the harness, or whatever its proper name is. With that, she hung up. I took my coffee back to one of the lumpy old sofas that I had inherited from my uncle and stared out the window at a towering purple jacaranda. This wasn't exactly what I had in mind when I heard I had inherited a seaside house at East Buckleberry. For a start, the house wasn't even seaside, although it was technically so, if you didn't count the fact that there was no surf, only broad water. The broad water was the section of ocean between East Buckleberry and a huge island. The surf was on the other side of the island, so East Buckleberry had zero surf, and while it was still ocean, the lack of surf was most disappointing. Persnickel was sleeping in the living room under the shade of an old marble-topped walnut credenza. I wondered if he would even be awake by ten. Wombats sure liked their sleep. Did I intend to go through with this crazy plan of Oleander's? No one would mistake a wombat for a dog. Well, if I wasn't arrested, the worst that could happen would be that I would be kicked out unceremoniously. But at least I would have done my duty to Oleander, and she wouldn't bring up the harebrained scheme again. I was to be there at ten in the morning, so I should be back home by ten-thirty, and I could get on with my unpacking. I smiled to myself pleased at how I figured it would all pan out. At 9.45, I stuffed a bag of sliced carrots into my handbag and put on Persnickel's leash. At least he was awake now. When I got to my car, I wondered how I could get him inside. He was quite big and looked heavy. I opened the back door, and he jumped up and put his front legs on the seat. I bent down, and with all my strength, boosted him into the back seat. It was lucky I had spent most of my free time back in Melbourne lifting weights in the gym, because that sure was one heavy wombat. It seemed my uncle had taken him for rides in the car, because Persnickel allowed me to attach the dog safety harness to him, and was quite content being driven the short distance to the retirement home. Oleander was at the front gate, waving frantically. It wasn't as if I could have missed her, I pulled over and she jumped in beside me. We'll drive around to the assisted care section because I'm sure the ghost will be there, she told me. And look what I've got. She proudly held up a navy blue blanket that had the words therapy dog emblazoned on it in wide gold lettering. I rolled my eyes. Okay, let's do this. I pulled up under the shade of a tree and Persnickel jumped out of the car without assistance. Oleander and I managed to secure the therapy dog blanket over him. Now he looks just like a dog, Oleander said, but I did notice a look of concern on her face. He looks nothing like a dog, I told her. What dog looks like that? A chocolate Labrador that ate too much, she said hopefully. What about an American Staffordshire Terrier? Or maybe a British Bulldog? I shook my head. Okay, let's get this over with. I headed for the front door, trying to look confident, as if I wasn't doing something shady. A lady was sitting outside the front door, in the provided seating area, daintily sipping a cup of tea. Oleander introduced her as Josephine Gatz. What a lovely daughter you have there, she said, peering down at Persnickel. She looks quite big but is clearly not out of the crawling stage yet. Will she be walking soon? I looked in shock at Oleander, who signalled to me that the lady's eyesight wasn't very good. Yes, she'll be able to walk soon, I said, doing my best to keep a straight face. She sure likes her vegetables, Josephine said. I looked down to see Persnickel's head stuck in a potted plant. He was greedily devouring all the flowers. I like a child with a healthy appetite, she added. Josephine clearly wanted to get into an in-depth conversation, but Oleander pulled me away and ushered me towards the building. I was hoping we would not run into one of the nurses. Where exactly are we going? I asked Oleander. 
We can hardly go to Ursula Hackle's apartment, which is around the back, she said, because it's a crime scene. But I thought we could go to her office. I assume her ghost would hang around her office just as much as it would hang around her apartment. I shrugged. I was new to all this speaking to ghosts business. Won't there be a lot of nurses near her office? I asked her. Oleander stopped in her tracks. Oh, she said in dismay. I didn't think of that. Let's get out of here. We can come up with a better plan, I said hastily, but a nurse forestalled me. What are you doing here? She asked, although not unkindly. This is Goldie Bloom with her therapy dog, Purse Nickel, Oleander said without missing a beat. The nurse looked askance at Purse Nickel. Isn't that dog rather overweight? Yes, but the vet has him on a strict diet, I said, and he's rather self-conscious, so if you could keep the body shaming to yourself, that would be wonderful. We don't want him going off his kibble now, do we? No, said the nurse. She was rather flustered now. I took the opportunity to leave. Persnickel, Oleander and I were hurrying down the corridor when another nurse rounded the corner. In here? Oleander pulled me into a doorway. I'm sure she didn't want to explain Persnickel to another nurse any more than I did. Goldie, this is Athanasius's apartment. Even though Athanasius was not present, I knew Oleander was right. This could only be the room of Athanasius Chadwick Pryor. There were piles and piles of tweed blankets over the sofa, an old typewriter on the desk, a weather globe sitting on the floor, and stacks of books on Latin, Ancient Greek, and Linear B grammar. Should we wait to say hello? I asked Oleander, wondering if Athanasius would mind that we had chosen his apartment to hide in. I didn't have to wonder for long when a man with a shock of white hair tumbled into the room. Athanasius didn't see us at first. In his arms he carried a tower of lemon tarts, all piled one on top of the other. You're a hungry lad, Oleander called out. Athanasius got such a shock, he almost dropped all of those tarts. Oleander, Goldie, this is a surprise indeed. Lemon tart. Can you spare one? I quipped but Athanasius took my question seriously. Perhaps not, he mumbled. Shocking news about the murder, isn't it? Just shocking. We're all absolutely devastated, naturally. Completely bereft, he added happily. Ursula Hackles never let us eat lemon tarts, or carrot cake, or muffins. She confiscated them and kept all those delicious treats for herself. That's horrible. I said, yes, Athanasius said cheerfully, and now she's dead, so I get to eat as many lemon tarts as I like. I'm not saying I'm happy she's dead, but am I unhappy? Athanasius didn't answer the question. Instead, he sat down on a pile of books that formed a chair and started munching away. A nurse knocked on the door and stuck her head into the room. There you are. I thought I saw you come in here. You had better come with me, she said to me. The residents are having their morning tea in the northwest courtyard right now. Come this way with the therapy dog. Oleander and I exchanged glances, but I had no choice but to follow the nurse. She opened the door and indicated the residents sitting in the courtyard. Another nurse came up and spoke to me. Why do you have a wombat on a leash? He's a therapy wombat, I said wondering how I managed not to laugh. It's a new program, Therapy Wombats of Queensland. Haven't you heard of it? She shook her head. He's quite tame, I said. He likes it if you stroke his head. The nurse gingerly bent down and stroked his head, and Persnickel sniffed her shoes. I think he likes me, she said in delight. They haven't sent the Therapy Wombat blanket yet, Oleander said to the nurse. That's why it says therapy dog. The residents let out squeals of glee when they saw Persnickel. I took him to each one in turn, and they all stroked his head. He clearly enjoyed the attention. 
I gave him little pieces of carrots at intervals just to make sure he stayed happy and away from the flowers. After we had done our second round of the residence, Oleander whispered to me, Have you seen her? No, I whispered back. Is this close to where her office was? No, it's around the other side of the building, she said. How about we say that Persnickel needs a bathroom break, and we can go around to that section and come in the back way? Brilliant! Why didn't I think of that? Oleander duly announced that Persnickel needed a bathroom break, and we walked around, skirting the back of the building. We walked down a corridor without being stopped by any nurses. All at once, Oleander pulled me into a room. It was a hideous office. The curtains were lace, the cushions fuzzy, and the walls were filled with awful quotes made into posters. I missed the eccentric comfort of Athanasius's apartment. In the corner of the room was a huge wooden cupboard. I could imagine Ursula Hackles locking someone in there. This is Ursula Hackles' office, Oleander said. Yes, I know, I said, as an angry apparition appeared in front of me. Chapter 5 The first thing I noticed about the ghost of Ursula Hackles was the keys jangling at her waist, just like Oleander had said. I wondered where the real keys were now. I wanted to find them and return all the stolen possessions to the people who lived here. What an ugly dog, Ursula sneered, looking down at Persnickel. Funny, I replied, looking straight at her. I was just about to say the same thing. Ursula pursed her lips. She looked like a prune. I knew there was no point buttering up the woman. Who murdered you? I asked snappily. Why? She said at once, folding her arms. Because I want to help you from the goodness of my own heart or whatever, I replied, but I don't think she believed me. My voice did break when I said it, after all. What did she say? Oleander whispered in my ear. She wants to know why I want to solve her murder, I replied. They think I killed you, Oleander cried. You have to tell Goldie what happened to you. Ursula cackled. Good, she said to me. I know Oleander didn't kill me, but let them think she was the culprit. If I was thinking clearly, I might have pushed Oleander out of the room. Why had she opened her mouth? So you don't want the person who killed you brought to justice? I said. Fair enough. Goodbye then. Fine, replied Ursula. The truth is, I don't know. Big help you are, I chided the ghost. Anyone could have killed you. Loads of people wanted to. How kind, she snarled. Get over it, I snapped. I had no time for people like Ursula Hackles, even if those people had been murdered. Imagine stealing the possessions of the elderly and accusing them of misbehaving. What needed punishment in your eyes? I asked Ursula then. You punished the people who lived here by taking their things and locking them away. So what exactly needed punishment in your eyes? Talking? Whistling? Eating loudly? Ursula hollered. Breathing? Aren't people meant to breathe? I said. Not loudly. Let's go, Oleander. She doesn't know a single thing. I moved towards the door and was about to leave when Ursula spoke. I don't know who killed me. That's the honest truth. I didn't want to stay any longer in her presence. Without a goodbye, I ushered Oleander and Persnickel from the room. I decided to let Persnickel loose in the flower bed outside Ursula Hackle's apartment while Oleander and I talked. Well, Oleander said timidly, if she wasn't dead, I told her, I'd have killed her myself. What are we going to do? Oleander cried. Don't you worry. I'll figure out who killed Ursula Hackles. For now, I had better get Persnickel home so he can watch his favourite TV show. I said goodbye to everyone and left the retirement home, but not before Athanasius fed Persnickel a lemon tart. When I got home, 
I realized I had nothing for dinner that night, so I pulled on my most comfortable four-inch stilettos and went into town. I stocked up on seven microwavable dinners for one, thinking I'd spend the night stress-eating over Oleander, when I noticed Max leaning against a motorbike on the other side of the road. I didn't know anything about motorbikes, but this one looked beautiful, I thought, in spite of myself, trying not to look at Max's bum. Look here, Max, I shouted, barreling across the road. I had decided to be eco-conscious and refused plastic bags, which I was now regretting. The microwavable dinners were bulky in my arms. As I crossed the road, a garbage truck nearly hit me. The driver leant out of his window to yell at me, so I yelled back. My little chat with the ghost of Ursula Hackles had shaken me up. Jaywalking in front of an officer, said Max. That's gutsy of you. Oleander didn't kill anyone, I said. Hello to you too. Quit being cute. You think I'm cute, he said, and to his credit, he looked both pleased and a little flustered. He dropped the keys to his motorbike and bent to pick them up. I rolled my eyes. This is serious, my friend is the lead suspect in a murder she did not commit. How do you know, said Max, because the police questioned her. I mean, how do you know she didn't do it? Because my wombat familiar helped me see the ghost of the victim, who said she knows it wasn't Oleander, I wanted to say. But instead, I replied, because she just didn't, you butt lamp. Butt lamp? That's right, butt lamp. That's what you are. Good day. I spun on my heels and marched off down the road, microwavable dinners dropping from my arms. I didn't get far because Max hurried after me. I wish I could help, Goldie, but I'm not on the case. I'm on leave. For what it's worth, I know Oleander is innocent. That makes two of us, I replied. I'm just curious, added Max. Do you by any chance like to drink wine? Of course. I said. I am human, after all. That's good, he said. He really did look flustered. Because I was wondering. I didn't get a chance to find out what Max was wondering, because it was then that I saw a flash of red hair. It was Dr. Henry Swan, and he was carrying a carton. Hello, Goldie. I've just been to the post office. Champagne shipped in from France. There is nothing worse than bad champagne, so I've got to have the good stuff. Hello, Max. I turned around, but Max was already on his motorbike, roaring away. He doesn't seem to like you, I said to Henry, unless it's me he doesn't like. It could be me. I just accosted him with microwavable dinners. Max doesn't like anyone. We grew up together, did you know? I didn't. Yes, I even live with his family for a time. The Graysons were always kind to me. All of them but Max, that is. He never forgave me for breaking his nose when we were children. You broke his nose? Oh, yes, playing rugby. Totally innocent, of course. Still, he probably can't let it go for another reason. Henry and I walked along the street. I could practically taste the pina coladas and feel the salty sea breeze in my hair right now. Another reason? I didn't want to pry, but I was also quite taken by Henry. What do you mean? His father treated me like a son. He even paid for me to go to medical school. Max was always so jealous. He never did well in school, young Max. His father was always disappointed in him. When the old man died, he left me a lot of money in his will. But of course, Max, being a cop with lawyer connections, never let me see any of it. I was aghast. That's horrible. Well, here's me, said Henry, pointing to his car. I hope to see you around soon. And just so we are clear, Goldie, I never mind when a beautiful woman accosts me with microwavable dinners. I tried not to think too much about the beach as I watched him drive away. That evening, I turned on the television for Persnickel. 
I had discovered the previous day that Persnickel enjoyed Starsky and Hutch, a 1970s cop show about two streetwise detectives. I'd never watched it myself, but it felt as though my uncle had recorded every episode ever made. Persnickel had nipped at my ankles the previous night when an episode ended, so I put on another, which he watched like he was seven years old, and it was his morning cartoon. I figured if I needed to call Persnickel in for food when he was busy eating the neighbor's flowers, all I needed to do was shout, Zebra 3, the radio call sign for Starsky and Hutch, and he would come waddling home. I was just turning on the television when there was a knock at my door. It was Detective Max Grayson. I had spent the afternoon thinking about Max and Henry, and how Max had betrayed the man who was like a brother to him. I was wearing a French green clay face mask, which was green, as the name suggests. Two seconds before turning on the television, I had been lying on the couch with cucumbers on my eyes, but they'd both fallen to the ground, and Persnickel had eaten them before I had a chance to stop him. Goldie? Max? I replied stiffly. I was hoping to trouble you for a cup of coffee, he said, staring in obvious concern at my face. A real cup of coffee. It's been a little while since I had one of those, and, you know, I am a cop. I stood aside to let him in. I made the coffee without saying a word. I knew he liked it black with no sugar, so I poured in almond milk and a splash of sickly sweet hazelnut syrup. For Henry, I thought. My wombat would like your car, I told him. I'm sorry, said Max. I thought you just said your wombat would like my car. That's right, I said, looking out the window at Max's car. It wasn't a Ford Torino, like Starsky and Hutch drove, but still, it was deep red. I figured Persnickel loved deep red cars. On our walk the previous day, he had always stopped when a red car thundered past. Max winced when he took his first sip. Is there anything else I can help you with, detective? I said curtly, long before Max had even finished his coffee. Or was it just coffee you were after? I thought of poor Henry and how badly Max had treated him, all because Henry accidentally broke his nose and Max's father had loved Henry. No, he replied. Nothing. I'd better be going. Sorry to have bothered you. He moved a little slowly as he headed for the door. He'd been moving strangely for a little while, now I came to think of it. I wondered if he was hurt. He paused in the doorway. Be careful of Henry, won't you? Then Max craned his neck to look around the room, as if Dr. Henry Swan might spring out of the shadows at any moment. Goodbye, Max, I said curtly. I couldn't believe it. Detective Max Grayson is jealous, I whispered to Persnickel as Max's car spun away. Persnickel paid no attention to me. He was sitting happily on the carpet, watching his favourite television show in the last patch of warm evening sunlight. Chapter 6 I awoke the next morning at six. I knew that because I woke up, looked at the time on my phone and said aloud to myself, Wow, it's six o'clock. I didn't wake up at five after all. I wonder why. I soon answered my own question when I realised that my speech was slurred. Maybe I'd slept in because I'd had too much wine the night before. I staggered to my feet and marched zombie-like to the coffee machine. I didn't think I made a very good cup of coffee, but then again, isn't the first cup just for the caffeine, and the second cup is to be enjoyed? That was my philosophy, after all. I walked unsteadily into the living room and gently lowered myself onto the couch. Persnickel was asleep in front of the TV. I remembered that I had left him watching Starsky and Hutch. I was grateful that he hadn't come into my bedroom and woken me up to demand another episode. But then again, maybe he had. I don't think I would have been in any fit state to notice. Just after six, my phone rang. What was it with this town? Every day I had been here, someone had called me at some ungodly hour of the morning. I tried to put on my best, 
Yes, I am awake, and no, I am not hung over, voice, and said, Hello? I expected it to be Oleander, but it was Athanasius. Goldie, I have some terrible news. I clutched my throat. Oleander hasn't been murdered, has she? There was a moment's silence, and then he said, Oh, my goodness gracious me, no. She has been arrested. Arrested? I shrieked so loudly that Persnickel opened one eye. He promptly shut it again and recommenced his snoring. Why was she arrested? It was a silly question, which I realized as soon as I said it. The police found her fingerprints on the packet of codeine that they took from her room. Her fingerprints? I echoed. How is that even possible? Oleander said she didn't take codeine ever. That is correct, he said firmly. Oleander only ever took Panadol. She didn't even like the generic brands of paracetamol. I have no idea how her fingerprints were on the packet of codeine, but apparently they were. I took a large gulp of coffee and then coughed as it burned my throat on the way down. Oh, yes, I remember now that Oleander told me about it. She said she had touched the packet when she found it. So, obviously, Ursula Hackles was murdered with codeine. That was the second obvious thing I had said in the space of minutes. She was allergic to codeine, Athanasius informed me. How do you know that? I asked him. Everyone knew it, he said. She was allergic to codeine and morphine. She even wore one of those medical alert bracelets. She was always going on about her allergies. She had food intolerances as well, but nothing that gave her an anaphylactic reaction. That might have been dangerous. No more dangerous than codeine to someone who was allergic to it, I pointed out. Athanasius, what do we do now? You'll need to do a spell, he informed me. I slapped myself on the head. That reminds me, I haven't even set up my altar yet. I'll get right on it and I'll do a spell that Oleander will be proven innocent. And that the murderer will be revealed and that he or she doesn't harm anyone else, too, Athanasius said. I'll do a spell for the same. Does Oleander need a lawyer? I asked him. Yes, I've already organized it, he said. I sighed long and hard. I don't know how all this works. Will she get bailed out today? Or does it take a few days for someone to get bail? Do you know anything about it? Athanasius cleared his throat. Her lawyer is going to call me and let me know. Goldie, you and I are her only hope. The police think they have the motive, and they think they have the means and the opportunity. It's not looking good for her. We have to find out who the murderer really was. Can we do that later in the day? I asked him. I'm not feeling awfully well right now. I will get right on it, though, I added. Goldie... Come to the retirement home about ten. Pretend you just want to make conversation with the residents and someone might let something slip. All right, I said reluctantly. I don't have to bring Purse Nickel, do I? He seemed surprised. No, not at all. I will send you home a lemon tart for him, though. I thanked him and hung up. I busied myself for the next hour or two, drinking plenty of coffee and taking Panadol for my hangover, not to mention lying on the sofa with a cold pack on my head. When I realised it was eight, I forced myself to get ready. I decided to dress down by wearing my three-inch stilettos and a tight pencil skirt. I drove to the retirement home, realising I hadn't arranged a place to meet Athanasius. I figured I would just go to his apartment. Thankfully, Athanasius opened the door just as I raised my hand to knock. I hope it's okay to meet you here, I said, but he grabbed my arm and pulled me inside. He had quite a strong grip, which surprised me as he looked frail. Before he could speak, I said, Why do you have an apartment in the assisted living section? They didn't have any spare apartments in the independent living section when I wanted to move in, and this was a head nurse's former apartment. They sold it to me cheap. I nodded. That's good. I didn't know what else to say. What plans do you have in mind? 
It's a lovely day, so the residents will be out in the courtyard having their morning tea. We'll just go and mingle and ask them questions about Ursula Hackles. We'll have to be quite subtle, of course. I nodded. Of course. Well, you lead on, Athanasius. By the way, have you heard from Oleander's lawyer yet? His face fell. Yes, sorry to say. I'm afraid they will be holding her for three days. Three days? I exclaimed. Why, that's ridiculous. She didn't do it. The lawyer said there is a possibility that she won't even get out on bail. I realized I had made a strangling sound because he patted me on the shoulder. The lawyer said she is quite sure she will get out on bail, but there is a possibility that she won't. I was getting more and more worried by the minute. I followed him out to the courtyard, where every manner of delectable cake lay across the table. I spied Athanasius's favorite lemon tarts, as well as many pavlovas and cupcakes in an array of beautiful colors. One of the nurses saw me looking and said, All the other nurses and I are trying to make up for what Ursula Hackles did. We bought these cakes personally to give to the residents. That's kind of you, I began, but she waved a hand in dismissal. It's the least we could do with what they've all been through. Another nurse, a young one, spoke up. If only we could get the keys to the storage room where Ms. Hackles kept all the confiscated items of the residence. You don't have the keys? I asked in surprise. The nurses shook their heads sadly. She kept the keys well hidden, the older nurse said. Can't you break the door down? I asked her. She shook her head again. It's a very sturdy door. I expect someone would have to take a chainsaw to it. The key will turn up soon, and then we can return the belongings to all the residents. The residents were gleefully tucking into the cakes, all apart from one woman. I didn't get any sleep last night, she spat angrily. That dreadful woman in the next room was coughing and gasping for air all night. How selfish of her. Didn't she know other people were trying to sleep? The young nurse tried to soothe her. Now, come on, Clara. You know that Vicky is very ill. She was transferred to the Gold Coast University Hospital this morning in a very serious condition. A pity she wasn't transferred last night, Clara barked. I took my time to sum up the woman. This must be Clara Swan, Henry's mother. She had fiery red hair, which... Given her age, I figured wasn't natural, but it suited her well. They say the apple doesn't fall far from the tree, but Henry was nothing like his mother. He seemed kind and caring, whereas she looked like a bird of prey, keen to devour anything that moved. She saw me looking at her and narrowed her eyes. Who are you? I'm Goldie Bloom. Can't you see I'm deaf? She yelled at me. People can see I'm deaf, but they don't come over and speak clearly. Come over and speak clearly to me. I walked over to her and yelled at the top of my lungs, I'm Goldie Bloom. Why are you yelling at me? She snapped. I'm over 90. I know I don't look it, but I'm over 90. People always yell at 90-year-old people because they think we're deaf. She had already told me she was deaf, but I knew better than to point that out to her. Instead, I offered her a plate of cakes. Would you like a cake? I asked her in a loud and clear voice. She shook her head. I have food intolerances. I'm lactose intolerant, gluten intolerant, and I'm on the FODMAP diet, so I can't eat garlic or onions, among other things. I have to be exceptionally careful what I eat. I can't have dairy because... She went into a list of explicit symptoms in great detail which I would not be able to repeat in polite society. Everyone paled and set down their cakes. When she finished speaking, she grabbed the nearest cream cake and stuffed it into her mouth. There went any romantic notions of a relationship with Henry. She was hardly good mother-in-law material. I wondered if I could ask Max Grayson for his help on the murder case, but I was still upset at how he had treated Henry. And why did I think of Max straight after I thought of mothers-in-law? I shook my head. Maybe I was still hung over. Clara continued to complain about people and her food intolerances, 
while eating cakes that were full of everything she said she couldn't eat. I noticed Harriet, so I walked over to her. Hi, Harriet, I haven't seen you since someone tried to kill you only a couple of days ago, she supplied. I nodded solemnly. It occurred to me that there had been two murders in town, and they had both happened after I arrived. A sinking feeling settled in the pit of my stomach. I looked around at everyone. It was very sad about Ursula Hackles. They all smiled and nodded and continued eating their cakes. I figured they were more so celebrating her demise than lamenting it. Did anyone know she was allergic to codeine? I asked them. The younger nurse snorted. Everyone knew. She was always going on about it. She could rival Clara with her list of allergies and food intolerances. I looked at Clara to see if she would be affronted, but she hadn't heard a single word the nurse said. I wonder if she could have taken it accidentally, I said to no one in particular. The older nurse shook her head. No, the police said it was ground up and put in her evening meal. I felt my jaw drop open. Who would have done it? I know it wasn't Oleander. There was a murmur of agreement. I can't believe any of the residents did it, the older nurse said, and I can't believe anyone on staff could have done it either. It certainly wasn't the kitchen staff. Why do you say that? I asked her. The kitchen staff always cook their own separate dinner, and Ursula had what they were having. No one person would have had the opportunity to slip anything into the food. What about Julie Medina? Athanasius spoke for the first time. She was on warning. The nurse looked doubtful. Julie wouldn't hurt a fly, she said. But the morning before Ursula died, she did tell Julie that she would sack her unless Julie resigned. Do the police know that? I asked her. She nodded. They do, but no one liked Ursula. They have more suspects than they can poke a stick at. They think Oleander is the murderer because of the codeine in her room, when it was well known that Oleander didn't take codeine and her fingerprints were on the packet. But Oleander had a legitimate reason for that, I told them. Both nurses nodded. Someone is obviously trying to set her up to take the fall for the murder, the younger nurse said. Athanasius spoke again. But who was it? I know we said it couldn't be one of the staff or one of the residents, but it had to be. After all, someone did murder Ursula Hackles. It could be someone present right now. Chapter 7 I wasn't awoken by an early morning call the following morning, but I still awoke at five. Maybe I had only slept in the previous day because of my hangover. There was certainly something to be said for hangovers, after all. I figured I would need to get block-out roller blinds and dispose of the old curtains that hung across my wide window. Perhaps I should also invest in an eye-sleep mask. I had just managed to unpack one whole room full of boxes when my phone rang. It was Athanasius, and I hoped he didn't have more bad news about Oleander. Still, she was in jail awaiting bail, so how much worse could it be? I reached for the phone with trepidation. Hello? I asked, realising that my voice came out shaky. We need to begin our investigation today, Athanasius boldly informed me. Yes, that's what we agreed yesterday, I said. I don't have a clue where to begin. Neither do I, he admitted. We need to start looking at other suspects. I said. Who should we start with? I don't have a clue. There are so many of them. I tapped my chin. Persnickel had woken up and was waddling to the kitchen, no doubt in search of his food. I hurried after him to fetch his wombat food from the cupboard. We'll just pick the most likely suspect and investigate that person today. You know these people better than I do, Athanasius. Who do you think is the most likely suspect? He didn't speak for a moment, but then he said, No one person stands out more than another, I'm afraid. I'm sorry, I just don't think I'm very good at this sleuthing business. 
I shut my eyes tightly and leant back against the bench top. If you had to pick a person, who would it be? Just pick someone, the most likely suspect who comes into your mind. It doesn't have to be right or wrong, just pick someone. Julie Medina. Julie Medina, I echoed. You think she's the most likely suspect? It took him a few moments to answer. I think so. She had the most to lose, what with her ailing, aged mother unable to leave town because all her friends are here. Julie would easily be able to get another job in aged care, but she wouldn't be able to if she had to stay in this town. There is not even normal nurse work here. No, with her mother refusing to leave town, Julie is pretty much stuck here. That makes her the number one suspect in my mind, now that I think about it. Excellent, then we'll start with her. My enthusiasm at finding a suspect that we could start investigating was soon crushed by the fact that I had no idea how to investigate her. Should I come to the retirement home today, Athanasius? I asked him. Persnickel looked up at me questioningly, so I dropped a few more bits of food in his bowl. If you keep eating like that, you'll never be able to pass for a therapy dog, I told him. Are you talking to me? Athanasius said. He sounded offended. No, sorry, I was talking to Persnickel. I asked you if I should come into the retirement home today. I don't know. I'll check Julie's rostered hours and get back to you. Could you come in just as she starts work, or maybe a little before? Sure, I said. Can you give me a call? Yes, I will. Oh, and I spoke again to Oleander's lawyer. What did she say? I asked him. She said that Oleander should definitely get out on bail because it's an ongoing investigation. In fact, she was surprised that Oleander was arrested at all. She thinks the case is quite tenuous. That's great news, I said. Do you know when the hearing is? The day after tomorrow, he said, and tomorrow is Ursula Hackle's funeral. I was shocked. So soon? Isn't it too soon to bury someone who has been murdered? I thought they always needed to hang on to the body in these cases. I think you've been watching too much American TV, Athanasius said. They've got all the evidence they need. They know she was killed by codeine and that she was allergic to it. So then she can be buried straight away. At least that's the gossip around the retirement home, and we've all been told that the funeral is tomorrow and everyone is invited to go. Oh. I was still trying to process the fact that the funeral was so soon. Do you think anyone will go? I'm sure there will be a big turnout, Athanasius said grimly. She was a very nasty woman. I hate to admit it, but some people will go there to celebrate. Sure, they will be doing so secretly, but they will still be celebrating. I pulled a face. Okay, then. Call me when you find out her rostered time today, and I'll be straight over. With that, I hung up and looked at the boxes. I had to decide whether to clean the house or to unpack more boxes. Unpacking boxes would make more mess, and I would have to clean again. Still, if having to clean again ever put anyone off, then no cleaning would ever be done. I grimaced when I surveyed the mess. I was something of a clean freak, and dirt and unpacked boxes in the haphazard scene before me was rather grating. I was unpacking the rest of my kitchen stuff that I rarely used, like my cold-pressed juicer and my blender, when Athanasius called. Hi, Athanasius. Do you want me to come in right now? No, Julie isn't rostered on today. It's her day off. Oh, my spirits fell. That's no good. What do we do now? Actually, it could work out for the best, Athanasius said. We can follow her. Follow her? I echoed. Where is she going? That's exactly what we will have to find out, Athanasius said in surprise. I imagined his bushy eyebrows shooting skyward. This is a small town, so we'll go to her house. If she leaves, we will follow her car. I couldn't really see the point, and I said so. What good will following her do? She will take us to her supply of codeine?
I realized he might have taken me seriously, so I hastened to add, that was a joke. I realize it wasn't a funny one. What I meant to say was that I didn't mean it seriously. I took a deep breath and started again. Let's say she did murder Ursula Hackles and planted the codeine in Oleander's room. What could she possibly do now that would make her look suspicious to us? That's exactly what we have to find out, Athanasius said brightly. And since we might have to be hiding behind bushes, dress for sleuthing work that involves hiding behind bushes. Can you swing by and collect me now? Sure, I'll just change my clothes. I hung up and then hurried back to my bedroom. Now where had I put my sensible clothes? I still had my three-inch stilettos, which were far more sensible than my four- and five-inch stilettos, so I put those at the foot of my bed. What sort of clothes would someone in a country town call sensible? I had no idea. I didn't have much time to decide, so I selected a pair of skinny jeans and a sensible silk blouse. I chose the darker colour of forest green, thinking it more suitable for detective work. When I arrived at the retirement home, I reached across and opened the door for Athanasius to get in. He looked me up and down and frowned. I thought you were going to wear sensible clothes for sleuthing. Oh, yes, I am, I said. He frowned more deeply, but said nothing further. You'll have to give me directions to Julie's address. Better still, would you like to drive there? I don't know this town, so that would be easier than if you gave me directions. His face lit up. It's an automatic, I added. He was out of the door and around my side of the car in an instant, barely giving me time to get out. I walked around to the passenger seat and buckled myself in. No sooner had I done so than the car took off like a rocket launcher. I was flung back in my seat. Whoa, I cried. Sorry, Goldie, he said. I haven't driven for a while. I'm a bit rusty. That's okay, I said, my voice trembling. Could you slow down a little? I managed to catch his glasses with one hand as he went around the corner so fast that his tortoiseshell-rimmed glasses flew off his face. I shut my eyes tightly. Maybe you should pull over and let me drive, I said. No, no, it's okay. I've got the hang of it now. Thankfully, he slowed down after narrowly missing a gum tree. The car came to such a sudden stop on the roadside that I was surprised that the airbags weren't activated. I jumped out and hurried around to his door, opened it and snatched the keys out of the ignition. There was no way I was ever going to let him drive again. When did you last drive? I asked him. He beamed at me as he got out of the car. I think it was back in 1947, just before I lost my license. I rubbed my forehead furiously. I didn't even want to know how he had lost his license. Unperturbed, he pushed on. Julie Medina's house is at the end of this road. It's just at the end of this mangrove swamp, or as the developer likes to call it, the magnificent mangrove wilderness area. I smiled at his cynicism. What do we do? I asked him. We're parked in a little park where people sometimes come to walk their dogs on leash, he told me. We're far enough off the road that Julie won't notice us if she goes past. And this is a no-through road, so when she leaves, she'll have to drive straight past us. How do you know she hasn't already left? I asked him. He tapped my shoulder and pointed. That's her house there. I followed his gaze to see a Queenslander. It was quite a nice Queenslander, but was painted in a most unattractive shade of sickly blue-green. The gardens were immaculate, manicured lawns dotted with beautiful magnolia trees. There was a small white car in the driveway. That would be hard to pick out of the crowd. If only it had been bright yellow. That's her car, Athanasius said. I wish we had brought some food, I said as my stomach rumbled. I haven't had lunch yet. Have you? He produced two lemon tarts out of the satchel flung over his shoulder and handed me one. I always come prepared. I thanked him and tucked into the lemon tart, grateful that he had spared me one of his precious commodities. Several tarts later, I was beginning to think that Julie would not leave her house that day. I said as much to Athanasius. 
I do believe you're right, Goldie, but I can't think of a better alternative, he said. Never mind, we're sitting in a shady spot. That, at least, was true. The picnic tables and chairs provided were all under a giant black shade cloth. Still, we could hardly sit there all day nibbling lemon tarts and hoping Julie would leave her house so we could follow her. It seemed a complete waste of time. Maybe she is doing something incriminating inside her house, Athanasius said. Like what? Caring for her sick mother? He shrugged. You never know. I realized where he was going with that line of thought. You want us to look through her windows, don't you? His face lit up. Good idea, Goldie. I slumped forward and put my face in my hands. I didn't want to end up on bail for trespassing and be thrown in prison along with Oleander. What if she sees us looking in the windows? I asked him. Before he could respond, the white car backed out of the driveway. I made a move to my car, but Athanasius caught my arm. Now we can look through her windows. I was confused. What? You don't think we should follow her? He shook his head. No. Now is the most opportune time to snoop on her. Hurry up, Goldie. She mightn't be gone for long. It was an isolated spot there amongst the mangrove swamp, so no one saw us as we hurried down the little dirt lane to Julie's house. Don't let her mother see you, I cautioned him. No, she said her mother's eyesight is bad and her hearing is even worse, he said. Let's split up. You take the left side of the house, I'll take the right and we'll meet at the back. I nodded. It seemed as good a plan as any. We walked up the stairs together and then split up. I peeked in the front windows but couldn't see her mother. I headed to the left, peeping in every window I could, first the kitchen window and then the bathroom window, which I was surprised to see had no curtains over it and was clear glass. Still, I supposed the only creatures that could look in were the snakes and the bats that lived in the mangrove swamp. I shuddered. The first window revealed a large bedroom that looked something like a bordello, not that I had ever seen one. Crimson satin sheets adorned the bed, which was a four-poster with some sort of crimson silk drapery held by gold brocade tassels. Erotic paintings hung on the wall, and the carpet was plush and white. I hurried to the next window, expecting to see Julie's ailing mother. I gingerly peeked through the lace curtains, but there was no sign of a mother and not even a bed. This room was clearly used as a storage room. There was a treadmill, which seemed to be used as a drying rack, because all manner of clothes hung over it. There was a fan in one corner, and the other corner had cardboard boxes stacked high. I walked to the next window, but again there was no sign of Julie's mother. This room did have a double bed in it, but the bed wasn't made, and the room did not look lived in. It, too, was used as a storage room. I didn't see any sign of incriminating evidence. I crept around the corner and found Athanasius waiting for me at the back door. Did you find anything useful? He asked me. No, what about you? He shook his head. Do you think we should break in? No, I said vehemently. No way in hell will I break into someone's house. Anyway, what did you see on your side? Bedrooms? Only one, he said. There's a huge dining room and a huge open plan living room and only one bedroom. Show me. I walked to the bedroom window, grateful for the cover of the golden cane palms and gorgeous fruity scented frangipanis, and peeked through the window, or to be precise, the French doors. As I looked through the glass, I gasped. Chapter 8 I grabbed Athanasius's arm. I don't think Julie has an ailing mother. Athanasius looked at me as if I had gone mad. Of course she has an ailing mother. Everyone knows that. Then where does she keep her? In a cage out the back? I swung my arm expansively past an old chook pen and a double garage made from green galvanized iron sheets. I'm sure she doesn't live in there. Athanasius rubbed his temples. I'm afraid I don't follow your reasoning. I took him by the arm. Come with me. Now the room with French doors is a study, right? 
There's no bed in it? He nodded. Okay, one bedroom is obviously Julie's, and she has one bedroom as a storage room, and the other room is just a storage room for more of her stuff. There is no mother here. Maybe her mother is visiting the doctor, Athanasius offered. I shook my head. No, I'm saying there is no bedroom that could possibly belong to another person who's living here. I'm trying to tell you that Julie lives alone. It's obvious. Look for yourself. Athanasius followed me back around to the side of the house and carefully looked through every window and then looked again. He scratched his head. That just doesn't make sense. Not unless the poor old dear passed away recently. Why wouldn't Julie have mentioned it if her mother died? I asked him. Perhaps she was too upset to speak about it. He shrugged. When was the last time she mentioned her mother? He was silent for a moment and then said, It was only two days ago, come to think of it. I overheard her telling one of the nurses that she couldn't bear to be fired from work because her mother wouldn't be able to leave town. I thought that was general knowledge, though, I asked him. He nodded. Yes, she was always saying that. She was very attached to East Buckleberry and always said it was because of her mother. We only saw one person in her car, didn't we? He nodded. Yes, I didn't see anyone else with Julie when she drove away. You know, her mother could be visiting friends in town, or she could be out playing bingo for the day. I shook my head. No, Athanasius, we've just been through this. Her mother doesn't live with her. No one lives with her. He nodded slowly. This is most puzzling, most puzzling indeed. What should we do? The first thing we should do is ask her how her mother is. We should lead her into conversation about her mother to see what she reveals. If she says her mother is still living with her, then we know she's lying. Something occurred to me. Athanasius, has anyone ever seen her mother? Athanasius stroked his chin. I haven't seen her mother, but then again I would have no reason to see her. I haven't heard anyone say that they've met her mother so perhaps I should do some asking around. You do that. Has her mother ever come to any function? What do you mean? I'm sure you have functions at special occasions, like Christmas and Easter, I asked him. Yes, we do. And no, her mother has never attended. Julie always said her mother is frail and elderly. Well, it seems to me she's lying about her mother. So what is she trying to hide? Why would Julie invent a frail mother who lived with her? I can't think of any reason to do so. We shouldn't stay around here and speculate, Athanasius said. Let's go back to your car. Julie might have driven somewhere local, and so she could be home at any minute. We both hurried back to my car as fast as we could. I found walking fast over the gravel hard in my stilettos, but I somehow managed. We sat in my car for a moment while we thought things over. I turned on the engine and cranked up the air conditioning. Athanasius turned to me. What do you think she's hiding, Goldie? I have no idea, I said, but I wonder if it has something to do with the murder of Ursula Hackles. Think about it, Athanasius. Julie gets a warning and then Ursula Hackles is murdered. There is some reason that Julie Medina is very attached to this town and won't leave it, so she's pretending she has an ailing mother as a cover. That is indeed where our investigation should take us now, Athanasius said. I'll ask around the retirement home to see if anyone has seen her mother. And if her alleged mother is so ill, she would be seeing a doctor. Perhaps, Athanasius said, but that won't help us, because we won't get any information out of any doctors, not with patient-client confidentiality. I nodded. That's true. How else can we find out about this mysterious mother? Athanasius shrugged one shoulder. I think you'll have to leave this part of the investigation to me, Goldie. Why don't you take me back to the retirement home now, so I can start asking questions? I placed my hand on his shoulder. Be careful, Athanasius. If she is the murderer, then it won't be good if she finds that you've been asking questions about her. Be careful and be subtle. Athanasius rubbed his hands together with glee. 
Yes, I will. This is very exciting. I was about to drive off when Athanasius let out a shriek. It's her. She's back. Don't drive off yet, Goldie. But she's still alone, I said. There's no sign of this alleged mother. We should sneak back to her house and spy on her now, he said. But it's broad daylight, I protested. She's sure to see us. Athanasius was out of the car in a flash. I was surprised that someone of his age could move so fast. He sprinted across the road and into the mangrove swamp. I hesitated for a moment and then took off after him. I didn't dare risk calling out, but luckily he was waiting for me under the cover of a swamp paper bark tree. Are you mad? I hissed. What do you intend to do? Snoop, of course, he said in a matter-of-fact tone. I was exasperated. But we've just snooped, I said. What else can we do? Julie went somewhere and she wasn't away long, Athanasius said. Perhaps she went shopping. We can look through the window and see what type of shopping she bought. If it's grocery shopping, then... His voice faded away. I folded my arms over my chest. Do go on, I raised my eyebrows. After a moment, he shrugged. Look, I have no idea what we will find, to be honest, but I think it's a good opportunity to look through the windows while she's there. We already know that no one else is in the house, so if we're careful, she won't know we're there. If we're careful, I shrieked. What if she does see us? How will we explain that away? She'll call the police. Athanasius shook his head. No, she won't. I'll think of something. Without waiting for a response, he hurried further into the swamp. The ground was muddy, but thankfully the path we took was not covered with water. It was hard going with my heels. Each step made a sucking, squelching sound. It was all I could do to keep up with him. When we reached the back of the house behind the chook shed, Athanasius held his finger to his lips and then bent over and ran to the house. I followed him. I had noticed before that there were no windows in the back of the house, only a door. As I ran, I hoped that the door wouldn't open. I didn't know what on earth Julie would think if she could see two figures bent over and scurrying towards her house. Luckily that didn't happen, and we reached the back of the house in safety. Get rid of your shoes, Athanasius whispered in my ear. What? I whispered back. He pointed to my feet. Get rid of your shoes, they make a loud sound. I grimaced. I might get splinters, I protested, but I could see he was right. Without saying anything further, I took off my shoes and put them by the steps. If she comes outside, she might see them, he whispered. Throw them in the swamp. I was horrified. I will not throw my shoes in the swamp, I hissed. Do you have any idea how much they cost? He looked at me blankly. I'll hang on to them, I said firmly. Athanasius frowned, but protested no further. He beckoned me to follow him over to the side of the house that contained the kitchen, so I expected he wanted to see what she had bought. We crawled around on our hands and knees, which comfortably had us under window height. The floorboards creaked now and then, but the jacaranda tree's branches scraped the iron roof at intervals, so I was sure Julie would think nothing of it. I hoped so, anyway. As we approached the kitchen window, I could hear a voice. Athanasius sat with his back to the wall and motioned for me to do likewise. The kitchen window was open, and I could hear Julie clearly. Are you sure you can't come over tonight? I've just bought everything for dinner. I was going to make us a beautiful candlelit dinner. Athanasius and I exchanged glances. Yes, I know it's an emergency, she continued in a louder voice. But surely it won't take you all night. Can't you come around at eleven or even later? She was silent for a while and then said, I could reheat your dinner. After another interval, she said, Can't you at least come over for a bottle of wine? You were supposed to stay the night. She sounded most disappointed. I figured she had a lover, but so far we hadn't heard anything useful. The refrigerator door banged shut, and I could hear Julie putting food away in the cupboards. She didn't seem to be in a particularly good mood. 
Yes, I'm sure you will make it up to me, but I've had a bad day. The police questioned me this morning. I'm sure they think I'm a suspect in that dreadful woman's murder. The person on the end of the phone must have spoken for some time, because there was a rather long interval before Julie spoke again. No, of course I haven't told them about you, and I won't tell them. Yes, our secret's safe. Of course I won't tell them. Her voice rose to a high pitch. Anyway, could you at least say something comforting? You really don't think the police suspect me, do you? Yes, I know they arrested Oleander, but that won't stick. They'll find out sooner or later that she didn't do it. Julie spoke a little longer and then hung up. She was obviously in a temper and more crashing and banging followed. Athanasius signaled to me that we should leave. I didn't need telling twice. I crawled on my hands and knees as fast as I could, which proved rather difficult while holding a pair of shoes. When we reached the back of the house, we both stood up and sprinted for the mangrove swamp. I managed to get some bindies in my bare feet as I did so, so my feet were sore and sorry by the time I reached the cover of the trees. Wait for me, I hissed. What secret is safe? Athanasius said. I'm sorry? I grabbed a mangrove tree branch and rubbed the sole of my foot. Julie said her secret was safe. She said she wouldn't tell anyone. She said she wouldn't tell the police about the person on the other end of the phone. But he's a married man, obviously, I said. Isn't that obvious? He shook his head. No, I don't think it's obvious at all. Why would it be a secret if he isn't married? He must be married, and so they would need to keep the affair from the police. Clearly, he's frightened that his wife will find out. You're jumping to conclusions, Goldie. Athanasius banged his shin on a fallen log and stopped to rub his leg with both hands. It could be something to do with the murder, he added when he straightened up. Julie and her lover might be in it together. I massaged the sole of my other foot. Yes, that's possible. Put your shoes back on, Athanasius said. I've got bindies stuck in my feet, I complained, wincing as I pulled them out. A bindi was a nasty, low-growing weed that covered most lawns in Australia. The burrs on the plant had spikes, small but painful when embedded in flesh. I'm going to need to soak my feet in a long, hot bath. I don't suppose anyone in town does pedicures. Pedicures? Athanasius said. Certainly. An hour south, that is. They don't do anything like that in East Buckleberry. Imagine that, I snapped. I put my shoes back on, but they were filled with mud. On the bright side, the mud did seem to soothe all the little jabs that the bindies had made in my feet. They don't have crocodiles around here, do they? I asked Athanasius as we hurried through the mangrove swamp. No, we're too far south for crocodiles, he said. They're all up in North Queensland. There are plenty of sharks around here, though. He must have noticed the horrified look on my face because he added, Goldie, you're only in an inch of water. Sharks don't come out on dry land. I pulled a face. I know that. It's just that I thought I might go for a swim in the water opposite my house. His eyebrows shot skyward. No, you can't do that. There are plenty of sharks in the broad water and the canals. They devour unsuspecting tourists all the time. The locals know not to go in the water. Then where do you swim? I asked him. Only at beaches between the flags, he said, and there are certain beaches where they have built a wall in the water so the sharks can't get in. Would there be one of those beaches at East Buckleberry? I asked him. No, the closest one is about an hour south, he said. I only barely resisted the urge to scream. Chapter 9 I was worried about leaving Persnickel home alone for several hours while I attended Ursula Hackle's funeral. After all, I had previously only left him alone while attending to some local sleuthing. He couldn't escape from the house yard, but I couldn't help but be concerned. Still, he had eaten a hearty breakfast along with a few little carrot treats and now was asleep. Given the fact he was a wombat, he might sleep the whole time I was away. I certainly hoped so. Having a wombat as a roommate 
wasn't as bad as I first thought it might be. He didn't shed, and he didn't have a doggy odour. He didn't even have a wombat odour. He made quite a good house guest. Oleander's bail hearing was the following day, and that spurred me on. I hoped I would find something to help in her case. All I had so far was the fact that Julie didn't have an ailing mother, at least not one who lived with her, and she did have a secretive lover. Of course, that didn't mean she was the murderer. Athanasius had said he would meet me at the funeral home as the retirement home bus would take the residence. I assumed that the bus would once more be driven by Harriet. I was there a little early. I still hadn't grown accustomed to the fact that going from one side of town to the other only took five minutes. I walked into the chapel at the funeral home and saw not many other people there. A lady in a white suit handed me a pamphlet. I recognised the young man at the far side of the room as the detective who had interviewed Oleander, and I was sure the man with him was the other detective, although he had a rather forgettable face. I knew from watching crime shows on television that detectives always attended the funeral of a murder victim. I had no idea why. I couldn't imagine what they thought they would find out. Did they expect the killer, full of remorse, would throw themselves on the coffin and lament their evil deed? I thought not. I didn't recognise anyone else in the chapel, so I took a seat at the back. The funeral home seemed old and dated and had a bit of a musty smell about it. At least it had a good view. I stared out the window at the water across the road. There were some unremarkable steel buildings blocking most of the view and I wondered what sort of business it was. My thoughts were broken by the arrival of the retirement home bus. I walked outside to meet Athanasius, but there was no sign of him, and the bus was far bigger than the one Harriet had driven previously. I stood to the side and waited as the residents piled out, some of them in wheelchairs and some in walking frames. Just as most of the people had filed out of the bus, a smaller bus pulled up. I recognised Harriet at the driver's seat and hurried over to the bus. I sighed with relief when Athanasius got out. He greeted me with, Did I miss anything? I shook my head. No, the service hasn't started yet. The detectives are about the only ones in there, if you don't count a whole bunch of the people who run the funeral home. I thought Ursula Hackle's relatives would be here. He pulled me aside and said in a stage whisper, She didn't have any relatives. What? No relatives? I said in disbelief. I supposed that explained the lack of flowers in the chapel. He nodded. She was an only child, and her parents died years ago. What about cousins, aunts, and uncles? I asked him. He shrugged. No. Everyone at the retirement home said she didn't have any relatives. I don't know the details. Oh, we should have thought of relatives. He quirked one eyebrow. What do you mean? I mean, we didn't even consider relatives, Athanasius. We should have thought that her relatives were suspects, but we didn't even consider them. But she doesn't have any relatives, he said in bewilderment. I sighed. Yes, I know that now. It's just that I didn't know that before, so I'm annoyed with myself for not considering that her relatives were suspects. But she didn't have any relatives, he said again. I rolled my eyes. Forget I said anything. Anyway, let's go in. I took him by the arm, and the two of us walked together into the funeral home. Clara Swan was complaining loudly. This is the day I always get my hair done. Trust that selfish Ursula Hackles to die and have a funeral right on the very day that I'm supposed to get my hair done. And I used to think she was such a pleasant woman. Hush, a nurse said. Everyone can hear you. Of course they can't hear me, Clara said in a loud voice. I'm whispering. My hearing aids are working fine. With that, she stuck her fingers in her ears, and the most hideous, high-pitched sound emanated from her hearing aids. Clara, apparently, was the only one who couldn't hear it. Josephine Gatz waved to me, and I waved back. I was surprised that she recognised me from that distance, given that she had thought Persnickel was my daughter. The residents took a long time to be seated, and there was a lot of fussing. Athanasius whispered in my ear, 
Goldie, do you realize the murderer is in this room now? I jumped. Where? Athanasius shot me a pitying look. Obviously, I don't know the identity of the murderer, but surely the murderer is here. Why else would the police be in attendance? I suppose so. It wasn't a comforting thought. I nudged Athanasius in the ribs. Look, there's Julie Medina. Let's see if she's overly friendly with anyone. Julie made a beeline for the other staff members and sat with them. She did not give so much as a sidelong glance to any of the men present. We will keep a careful eye on her throughout the proceedings, Athanasius said. I was hoping Athanasius and I would be able to discuss people as the funeral progressed, but Harriet Hemsworth took it upon herself to sit next to me. How are you settling into life in East Bubbleberry? She asked me. I'm liking it so far, I said. It's very different to Melbourne, though. Harriet nodded sagely. Are you over the shock of that dreadful woman trying to murder you? I nodded. I'd almost forgotten about it, you know, given this murder. Oh, yes, you discovered the first body. I mean, this was the second murder, and you discovered the first murderer's victim. I noticed a large, dark blue folder on her lap. She saw me looking at it and opened it. You might think I'm silly, Goldie, but it took me a long time to collect these photographs, and I'm worried about crime at the retirement home. There's crime at the retirement home? I asked, puzzled. Yes, the murder, of course, she said. Since there's been one murder, then there could be thefts. If someone is going to murder someone, they would think nothing of stealing others' possessions, would they? I rubbed my forehead. I suppose not. I brought my folder with me to keep it safe. Did I ever tell you I was a naturopath before I retired? She asked me. I did colonics too. I shrugged. I didn't know. I took photos of the worst of my former patients and their ailments, she said. She thrust the opened black folder under my nose. I nearly passed out at the gruesome details in the photos. Harriet insisted that I look, so I opened my eyes wide and stared at an inoffensive spot in the middle of the page. Interesting, I lied. She nodded enthusiastically. Yes, isn't it wonderful? It took me years to take these photos of tumours and all my other lovely assorted photos. It's impressive, I said, hoping she would shut the folder quickly. I wasn't normally squeamish, but those photos were something else. Harriet looked up. Oh, look, there's a minister. I think the service is about to start. Mercifully, she shut her folder. I leant back in the seat and breathed a sigh of relief. Clara Swan was still complaining about everything in strident tones. One of the nurses took her phone from her and punched away at the keys. She's trying to adjust Clara's hearing aids, Athanasius told me. They can control the volume through an app on her phone. It's a shame the app on her phone doesn't control her own volume, I said, as Clara's voice got louder and louder. She was complaining about the colour of the wood grain on the coffin, the expression on the minister's face, and referring to the funeral home staff women as those little girls. She's a piece of work, isn't she? I whispered to Athanasius, but just then I saw Henry stride into the room and take his seat next to his mother. She smiled and kissed him on the cheek. I don't know how he puts up with her, Athanasius said. Josephine Gatz took a seat next to Athanasius, and at once leant across to the rest of us. You haven't brought your daughter today. Before I could speak, she pushed on. Oh, yes, I'm sure you think she's too young for funerals. It wouldn't be appropriate to bring her. That's for sure, I said. I've got the lowdown on the situation with Ursula Hackles, she said in a whisper. Harriet leant across me. What? You know who murdered her? Josephine made a choking sound in the back of her throat. Of course not, Harriet. I found out about her relatives. She had relatives after all, Athanasius said. Josephine shook her head. Of course not. I thought you knew that. No, I found out why she doesn't have any relatives. Well, actually, she does have a brother in England. 
By now, my head was spinning. I just wanted to go home and have another cup of coffee, or maybe a stiff drink. I tried to focus on what she was saying. Her brother, Nick, lives in Oxford. That's in England, you know. They were estranged and he doesn't like her. That's what usually happens when people are estranged, Athanasius said dryly. Josephine pursed her lips. Quite so. Anyway, she was his only living blood relative, although he is married and has children now. But she never met them because she was estranged from him. Does he have an alibi? I asked her. She nodded. Yes, he hasn't left the country in the last two weeks. I nodded. That is a good alibi, I must admit. Did you find out anything else? Athanasius asked her. She shook her head. No. Would you know of anyone with a grudge against her? I asked. Harriet, Athanasius and Josephine all laughed in unison. Look around the room, Josephine said, waving her hand. Everyone in this room had a grudge against her. Oh, I expect you didn't because you didn't know her, but you'd be the only one. Oh, and possibly the minister. If he hadn't met her, then he wouldn't have a grudge against her either. Athanasius nodded his head at me slightly, which I think was his way of asking me not to speak. He turned to Josephine. I wonder if Julia Medina's mother will come to the funeral. Josephine looked taken aback. Why would she come to the funeral? Did they know each other? Athanasius asked her. Josephine pursed her lips for a moment before speaking. No, I really don't think they knew each other. Besides, Julie and Ursula hated each other. I do hope Julie's mother is well, Athanasius said. I wonder if she's a nice woman. Have you ever met her, Josephine? She is quite a sickly woman, the poor old dear, Josephine said. She must be a hundred if she's a day. It must be hard for Julie not being able to leave this town because her mother refuses to leave her friends. Are any of Julie's mother's friends at the retirement home? I asked Josephine. I don't know, she said in bewilderment. You think they would be, wouldn't you? They must be about her age. You didn't say if you ever met her, Athanasius said. No, I don't think I have. But I do feel as if I know her with everything Julie's told me about her. Julie seems like a lovely, caring person, I said. Does she have a boyfriend? If not, it must be hard for her to look after her mother all by herself and work full time. No, she doesn't have a boyfriend, Josephine said. Athanasius and I exchanged glances. The mournful music started and silence fell over the room. I sneezed and figured it was the dreadful floral perfume of the lady in front of me. Her hair was teased so high that it was hard for me to see the minister out the front. The minister made a short speech about Ursula Hackles and didn't praise her to the hilt. I reflected that it was the first time that I had ever heard a eulogy where the person wasn't praised. He simply said she was the resident manager of the East Buckleberry Retirement Home, stated the length of time she had been there and said she was a good worker. He didn't even say she was well liked. He stopped speaking and there was rousing applause. I also hadn't heard applause at a funeral. Either they did things differently in the country, or they were all quite pleased that Ursula Hackles was dead, as awful as it sounds. But then again, she must have been a dreadful woman to take their possessions and lock them away and feed them dreadful food. I certainly wasn't about to feel sorry for the woman. The minister asked if anyone else wanted to speak, and Julie Medina stood up. I leaned across to Athanasius. Will she still keep working here now? I mean, given that Ursula Hackle sacked her the day before she died. I think that record has been dealt with, if you get my meaning, he whispered back. What, do you mean she has buried that evidence? He nodded. That's what the word around here is. That even makes her more of a suspect. 
I said. Athanasius shook his head. I think she's too obvious. I think the murderer is someone we don't suspect. Like who? He shrugged. I turned my attention back to Julie, and it seemed she was winding down her speech. She, too, did not say anything nice about the victim, other than the fact she was sorry that the murder happened at the retirement home. She said that as Ursula Hackles lived there, that was the reason it happened where it did, and it had nothing to do with the retirement home. It was quite a convoluted speech, and I figured she said it for the benefit of any relatives of the residents in her concern that they would remove the residents from the retirement home. As I looked around the room, I couldn't see anyone who was obviously a family member of a resident, so I thought she was quite safe. When the minister announced that Ursula Hackles was to be cremated, I turned to Athanasius. Oh, does that mean we won't be going to a cemetery? He nodded. That's right. As soon as the coffin disappeared behind a curtain, the minister brought the service to an end. I had never been to such a short funeral before. The Uniting Church of East Bucklebury has put on a morning tea for all the residents of the East Bucklebury Retirement Home and all other people who attended the service today, he said. If you go out the side door, across the courtyard and into the little wooden building, you'll find it. It's all set up. I invite you all to stay for refreshments. That will give us a good opportunity to ask more questions, Athanasius whispered to me. Questions about what? Josephine said. Clearly her hearing was far better than her eyesight. We want to find out who murdered Ursula Hackles, Athanasius told her. I was surprised he had been so upfront. It's because Oleander has been falsely accused, he added. Quite so, quite so, Josephine said. Word is that someone tried to frame her with the codeine. Everyone knows that Oleander doesn't take codeine. And I believe it was common knowledge that everyone knew that Ursula Hackles was allergic to codeine. I asked her. She nodded. Harriet leant across to join in the conversation. I'll help too. I could well be a suspect. In fact, I'm surprised I wasn't arrested. Why would you be arrested, Harriet? I asked her, puzzled. Oh, didn't you know? She shot me a penetrating look. Know what? I asked her. I wasn't one for guessing games. Well, because I was a naturopath and Ursula Hackles had me struck off. Struck off? I echoed. Do you mean struck off like a doctor is struck off? She nodded. I was a naturopath for many years in Burley Heads. Ursula Hackles happened to live in Burley Heads at the time, and she came to me for treatment. It was for a ganglion cyst on her foot. I told her that if she wanted it lanced, she should go and see a doctor. But she didn't want that. She said she was afraid of doctors, which is rather strange given her occupation. I tried to take it all in. So what happened? I asked her. She insisted I do something for it, so I took a large book and hit her foot hard with it. I gasped. You didn't? Oh, yes, Harriet smiled. They used to call them Bible cysts, because a good way to get rid of them was to hit them with the Bible. Why a Bible? I asked her. It was Athanasius who answered. A Bible would have been the biggest, heaviest book they had in those times. I nodded. Oh, and did that make her gangly thing worse? Ganglion? Harriet corrected me. No, it fixed it all right. So why did she get you struck off? I asked her. Because she was a spiteful, malicious woman, she said. She refused to pay me because I didn't give her any medication. She did not want to pay the consultation fee, so I contacted a debt collector. Wouldn't the debt collector's fee have been more than the amount she owed you? I asked her. Harriet nodded. Yes. Look, I know it was silly of me, but she was so nasty that it got my back up. Oh, I have regretted that for years, I can tell you. Anyway, my contacting the debt collector obviously put her nose out of joint. She called the Australian Council of Naturopaths and made outrageously false claims about me. They struck me off. I was never able to practice as a naturopath again. Do the police know that? I asked her. I told the young detective when he came asking questions of everyone, she said. 
but he just looked at me as if I was a silly old fool and said something condescending to me. Good for you, dear, Josephine said. It sounds like they won't be treating you as a suspect. I was alarmed. Could Harriet have murdered Ursula Hackles? Surely not. But then again, someone had, and that person obviously wasn't a likely suspect, given that Oleander had been arrested. Harriet was new in town. I would have to mention my concerns to Athanasius later. Something occurred to me. Did you have any idea Ursula Hackles was at the East Buckleby Retirement Home when you arrived? I asked her. Her hand flew to her throat. No! Had I known, I would never have come here. Did she recognise you? I asked her. Yes, and she would have known the name. I'm sure that's why she put milk powder in my food. What, she did it deliberately? I asked her. I thought it was in all the instant mashed potato. Harriet shook her head. If it was, then I'm sure she put more in just to spite me. That's the kind of person she was. Josephine stood up. Come on, Harriet, let's all follow the others out so we can find out about Julie. Please be careful, I begged them. You don't want to bring yourselves to the attention of the murderer. Harriet waved one hand in dismissal. Everyone thinks old ladies are ineffectual. Josephine nodded. Yes, most people think we're idiots. They condescend to us and call us dear. It makes me quite cross, but there's nothing I can do about it. Still, please try to be careful, I said. Without saying another word, they got to their feet and walked out the door. I hung behind with Athanasius. I hope they don't get themselves into any trouble, I said. I wouldn't worry about it, Goldie. They were right. Most people just think they're gossiping. Sad to say, people don't take the elderly seriously. Not in this country, at any rate. I'd normally say that's appalling, but in this case it will be good if it keeps Harriet and Josephine safe, I said. I walked out the door just as someone was coming in. A strong pair of hands grabbed my arms. I shrieked. Chapter 10 Max! I squealed. Oh, I mean Detective Grayson. What are you doing here? I took a step backwards and he released my arms. I was relieved to see him. Not least because he was wearing a jacket that looked really good on him. I knew the victim, he said. Sorry I nearly bowled you over. I wanted to have a word with the minister. He looked around the room. On second thoughts, I can always speak to him later. I followed his gaze and saw the two detectives looking at him. I wondered if Max was doing some snooping of his own. I was about to ask him when he turned and marched back across the courtyard. He's acting a little strangely, Athanasius said. That's what I thought. Oh, I've just realised they won't be serving coffee, will they? It will just be tea. Athanasius laughed. That's right. I don't suppose they'll have wine in there? I asked hopefully. Athanasius shook his head. Not a hope. Cake? There will be cake. There will be plenty of cake, and scones with jam and cream. A veritable feast lay before me as I entered the building. Table after table was laden with every manner of cake. Huge jam and cream sponge cakes were surrounded by plates of lamingtons and chocolate cupcakes with multicoloured sprinkles on top. It was as if I had gone back in time and was visiting my grandmother. A lady thrust a plate under my nose. Lamington? I declined only because the coconut shreds would get all over my clothes. I've just had an idea, Athanasius said. There's a park next door to the church, a public park. I looked at him and waited for him to continue, but he didn't. I asked, yes, what of it? Why don't you pop home and get Purse Nickel? You can take him for a walk in the park. I thought that rather a strange thing to say, but then I got his meaning. Oh, you think Ursula Hackle's ghost attended her funeral? He nodded. If I were a ghost, I'd want to attend my own funeral, especially if someone murdered me. Good point. I looked longingly at the cakes on the table. 
I'll save you some cakes, Athanasius said, and failing that, I can always give you some lemon tarts later. I saw Max looking in my direction, and I hesitated. I think Detective Grayson might want a word with me, I told Athanasius. Sure enough, Max made his way across the room, but one of the ladies from the retirement home forestalled him. You can always talk to him later, Athanasius said. Off you go, Goldie. Ursula Hackles might not want to linger around the food. She might have only been there for the funeral. I didn't need telling twice. I hurried back to the car park. When I got home, Persnickel looked as though he had just woken up. He had that half-awake look I have before I have coffee of a morning. I saw that he had eaten his breakfast. I'll give you a carrot treat, and then we'll go for a ride in the car, I told him. He became overly excited, but I didn't know whether it was the mention of the treat or the ride in the car that did it. After I gave him the treat, I fetched his harness out of a cupboard. He did the best wombat impression of dancing on the spot, which meant he slightly shifted his weight from side to side. I did the same thing that I had done the last time I had taken him in the car. I opened the back door, and he put his front legs in the car with a lot of grunting. I lifted his back legs into the car with a lot of grunting on my part. I secured the dog's safety clip to his harness and drove back the short distance to the funeral home. I clicked on his walking leash, and he jumped, or rather half tumbled, out of the car. Now, Persnickel, I have to speak to Ursula Hackle's ghost. Hopefully she's still hanging around. I walked around the side of the building where the others were having cakes, but she didn't appear, so I looked around to see if anyone was looking. There was no one in sight, so I walked around to the back of the chapel building itself. Any sign of her? I asked Persnickel, but he was too busy devouring flowers in the funeral home garden bed. I pulled him away with some difficulty. Just as I turned around, the ghost manifested in front of me. I stifled a scream. Cremated? She screamed at the top of her lungs. That no good brother of mine knew I didn't want to be cremated. He just doesn't want to pay for a headstone. Those things can be expensive. I'm sorry, I said. You're sorry? She screamed at me. I didn't particularly like being berated by a ghost, but I took the opportunity to study her more closely. She looked like a real, living person, only there was a shimmering around her. I had no words to describe it. I figured it had to be experienced, to be understood. Suffice to say, she looked like people did when I had a migraine headache. Well, did you find out who murdered me yet? She shrieked. I'm working on it. I said, do you have any idea who it could be? She looked daggers at me. If I did, I wouldn't have asked, would I? Could it have been Julie Medina? I asked her. Yes, it could well have been, she said. That lazy, good-for-nothing woman. She's always sucking up to the staff and the residents, always trying to get in their good books. She always fawns over the doctors, the other staff, and the residents. It's quite sickly, really. That woman has no backbone. Have you ever been to her house? I asked. That seemed to surprise her. No, we weren't friends. Did you ever meet her mother? I asked her. Her mother? What's her mother got to do with this? It would help if you answered my question, I said sternly. After all, I'm trying to do you a favour. No, you're not. You're trying to get Oleander off the hook. Yes, but you want to find out who murdered you, don't you? I actually don't think Julie Medina has anyone living with her, at least not an ailing mother. That's why I asked if you'd ever met her. The ghost stopped shimmering and solidified a little. No, I never did meet her mother. That's interesting. Athanasius and I snooped around her house yesterday, I told her and there was really only one bedroom that anyone was living in, and that belonged to Julie. There was no sign of anyone else. The only other room used as a bedroom was clearly a guest room and had storage stuff all over it. There was no way anyone could be living in that room. She made up the whole story about her mother. Why would she do that? She asked me. I shrugged. I don't have the slightest clue. 
I looked down and saw that Persnickel had eaten a whole fuchsia bush. Persnickel, stop that. I tightened my grip on his leash and added, There is another reason that she wants to stay in East Bucklebury, and she didn't want anyone to know what it was. So I'd say she invented her mother. She's having an affair. Ursula Hackle's jaw dropped. An affair? Are you sure? I nodded. Athanasius and I heard her on the phone. A man was supposed to go to her place last night for dinner, and he didn't, so she was quite angry. She also mentioned something about their relationship having to be a secret. He must be a married man, the ghost said. I nodded. Yes, that's what I thought. Unless, of course, the secret was that they both murdered you. I wouldn't put anything past that woman, Ursula Hackles said. She knew I was allergic to codeine. Everyone knew I was allergic to codeine. I've already told you that. Do you know what you ate that night that had the codeine in it? I asked her. The kitchen always made me a special meal, she said. So you didn't eat what the residents ate? She laughed cruelly. No, I wouldn't eat that stuff. The kitchen always made me a meal. After my shift, I would reheat it at the end of the day. I would simply pop in and reheat it. So no one delivered it to your apartment? She shook her head. No, if I wasn't there at six, they would put it in the refrigerator for me. Usually I was there at six. What about the day you were murdered? I asked her. Did you get it directly that day or was it in the fridge? No, it was in the fridge that day, she said. But what if someone else had eaten it and got poisoned by the codeine? I asked her. No, everyone knew that my food went on that shelf. Besides, it might not have been a high dose. I'm allergic to codeine, as I've told you repeatedly. She sighed dramatically. I shifted my position as my heels had sunken into the dirt. Hmm, so it had to be someone who slipped into the kitchen and put the codeine in your food. It's not as difficult as you would think she said with a wave of her ghostly hand. It wasn't in the actual kitchen refrigerator. They always put it in the small refrigerator in the staff room near my apartment. And hardly anyone goes into that staff room. Anyone could have accessed it in there. And you didn't see anyone who shouldn't be where they were meant to be that day? I asked her. No, I didn't see anything suspicious at all. What about Harriet Hemsworth? I asked her. Is there any chance she murdered you? Ursula shimmered again. I imagined it was in rage. Yes, why didn't I think of that? I wouldn't put anything past her. She's a nasty piece of work, that one. Come to think of it, she's new to town, and I've only just been murdered. If it was anyone else, they would have murdered me a long time ago. I find the timing suspicious. Do you think Harriet is actually capable of murder? I asked her. Putting your personal feelings aside, do you think that's possible? Yes, she shrieked. Who would you say is more likely to have murdered you, Julie or Harriet? She seemed to calm down at that. It could be either of them. The timing works for both of them. Harriet was new in town and she was angry with me. And Julie was also angry with me because I had just sacked her. I nodded. Is there anything else you can think of? Is there anyone else who could have possibly murdered you? She faded so much that I had to strain to see her. I can't really think of anyone else. Did you put milk powder in Harriet's food? She rematerialized and folded her hands over her chest. Of course not. How could you say such a thing? I was dismayed. I knew she was lying. It was as plain as the nose on her face. I would have thought she would tell me the truth, given the fact that she was already dead and I was trying to find out who murdered her. But apparently not. Her pride seemed more important to her, and she didn't want to admit that she had put milk powder in Harriet's food. Is there anything else that seemed out of place that day? I asked her. She shook her head. And you don't have any idea who murdered you? Who are you talking to? Came a voice behind me. I spun around. It was Athanasius. Ursula Hackles, I told him. I relayed the whole conversation, 
while simultaneously trying to keep Persnickel from eating the remaining flowers. That doesn't really help us too much, Athanasius said, rubbing his chin. He was clutching a plate of cakes. Let's walk back to your car and talk. As we walked, he said, I've had a good idea. I think I might know someone who would know whether or not Julie has an ailing mother. We decided that she didn't have one, I said. I thought it was a possibility that her mother might have gone to respite care or somewhere for a few days. You saw that bedroom, I said. That spare bedroom hasn't been used in ages. Athanasius nodded slowly. Nevertheless, I think you should question Henry Swan. Why can't you question him? I asked him. Because Henry has an eye for the ladies, he said. I'm sure he'd rather speak to you than speak to me. I suppose so, I said. Is one of those cakes for me? Yes, they all are. You look like you've got your hands full with Persnickel, so I'll take them to your car for you. I thanked him. After I went through my usual routine of getting Persnickel into the car, I took the plate of cakes from Athanasius. What's our next move? Tomorrow is Oleander's hearing. Would you mind taking me there, Goldie? I'd be glad to, I said. Do you know the way? He shook his head. I'll text you the address tonight and you can look it up. It's in Southport. Southport, I echoed. Southport was where I would be starting my new job next month, and I hadn't even scoped out the place yet. What time does it start? He shrugged. The court itself starts at ten, but I don't know how long it will be before Oleander's case comes up. We'll have to be there at ten. And Southport is an hour away? I asked him. It depends on the traffic, he said. We should allow an hour and a half. All right, then. I'll pick you up at 8.30. Athanasius left, and I put the plate of cakes on the floor in front of the passenger seat. I figured they were less likely to move than on a seat. As I shut the door, I turned around, and there was Henry Swan. Goldie, he said, I was called away. I had only just arrived at the funeral when I was called to an emergency. I've just come back, but it's all over. I hadn't even seen him leave but I thought it better not to mention that. It was a very short funeral. He nodded. Would you like to have dinner with me? I was dumbstruck. I hadn't been asked out in five years, not since Thomas had asked me out five years ago. I didn't know what to say. To make matters worse, Max Grayson was standing on the steps looking our way. I didn't think he could hear what we were saying, but I wasn't sure. At any rate, I remembered that Athanasius had said I should question Henry, so I figured I should accept. Yes, thank you. That would be lovely. When? What about tomorrow night? I'll call for you at seven. I'll meet you at the restaurant, I said. What's the name of it? Give me your phone. Without thinking, I reached in my handbag and fished out my phone. I handed it to him. He tapped away at the keys and then handed it back to me. I've just messaged myself from your phone. Now you have my number and I have yours. I'll text you with a time and place. He kissed me briefly on my cheek, which I thought rather forward, and then strode away. I crossed around to the driver's seat of my car door. As I opened my door, I looked up to see Max staring straight at me. Chapter 11 The first thing I noticed as soon as I got home was the box labelled Altar Stuff. I felt ashamed. Although I had only recently found out I was a sea witch by birth, I had long been a practising traditional witch. Usually, I was more careful with my practice, but I had been in East Bucklebury for several days and hadn't even set up my altar. What's more, a man had been murdered in my backyard, and I had not even smudged the place. I grabbed the nearest pair of scissors and opened the cardboard box. My white sage smudge sticks were on the top, and my tea light candles were directly underneath, along with my matches. I lit a tea light candle and then held a stick of white sage over it to catch a light. I blew out the flame, and when it was smoking well, I walked around the house, 
paying careful attention to the corners and under tables. I gave my uncle's old sofas a particularly good smudging. I opened the windows as I walked to let out the bad energy. It took me a while to go through the entire house, and I continually berated myself for not doing it sooner. In fact, I had intended that this would be the first thing I would do when I moved to East Bucklebury. Still, I supposed the fact that there had been a murder or two had thrown off my good intentions. After I smudged the house, I lit another stick of sage and went out to the general area where I had found the man's body only days ago. I gave the area a really good smudge. I imagined he had crossed over to the other side, or gone wherever ghosts go, because I hadn't seen him since we discovered his murderer. After the smudging was done, I looked around for a good place to set up my altar. I usually liked to have my altar in the south, because I was also into traditional feng shui, and the south was a good place for the fire element. The kitchen was in the south, which was also a good place for a kitchen, but next to the kitchen was a space I thought would be good for my altar. I had an old glass table I had bought quite cheaply. I dragged it into position. Thank goodness it was light. Once that was done, I scrubbed it down with lemongrass oil and gave it another smudge. I stood back to look at my handiwork. I had a wooden pentagram that I had bought as a Christmas decoration. Christmas stars make great pentagrams, and I placed it on the altar. I unpacked the altar box and put the contents on the dining room table. My three salt lamps were at the bottom of the carton, so I put them around the living room at intervals and switched them all on. Within moments, I felt the energy had changed for the better. I dug out a caramel-scented candle and put it on my altar next to my working candle. I also had a road opener candle I had bought from the USA on eBay, and I placed that on the other side of my working candle. Now that the place was cleansed, the next thing I should do was protect it. I had red brick dust and casserilla in separate glass jars. I walked outside and sprinkled both under the front doormat, and then put a trail of red brick dust and casserilla powder over every door and window frame. I couldn't find my charcoal discs, so I got out my incense sticks of frankincense, myrrh, and the Indonesian resin known as dragon's blood. I placed them in incense holders on my altar and lit them. The three ingredients together amounted to what is known as fiery wall of protection. I would have to do some spells later because I needed to get back into my practice, but for now, I was happy that the place had been cleansed and that I had protection going. I reminded myself to take a cleansing bath at night, a bath with sea salt, and maybe dill as it was a good curse breaker. I tried to think of a good protection herb, but I was too tired to think straight. I was still quite stressed over recent events. I had a witch cupboard, as I called it, an antique I had picked up in Melbourne. It was made of English oak and was quite beautiful. I usually kept all my herbs and candles in it, so I dragged it across next to my altar. I was glad that the window was just on the other side. The altar table and the English oak cabinet fitted perfectly. I was pleased once everything had been put away. I got out a large purple candle, purple for protection, and set it on the coffee table. I thought I would have coffee then do some more work, and then have lunch. I could eat some of those cakes Athanasius had brought me. I walked into the kitchen to make coffee when something rushed past my legs. I looked down to see Persnickel running to the back door with the lit candle in his mouth. Persnickel! I screamed at him. Stop! You'll catch on fire! My breath caught in my throat. I went cold all over. Persnickel pushed through the dog door in the back door with the candle in his mouth. I sprinted after him, but by the time I got outside, he was nowhere to be seen. Persnickel, I called out. Persnickel, come back here, you naughty wombat. I wondered if I should call the local vet and warn him that I might be bringing in a singed wombat. With my heart in my mouth, I ran around the side of the house. To my utter relief, Persnickel appeared to be unharmed. The candle was on the ground next to him, and it had gone out. 
Persnickel was furiously digging a hole, dirt flying in all directions. As I ran over to him, he looked over his shoulder at me, grabbed the candle, dropped it in the hole, and then covered it up. I ran over to him. Persnickel, I was worried you were hurt. Why did you steal that candle? And how did you get up onto the coffee table? I thought it would be too high for you. He completely ignored me and kept filling in the hole. I waved my finger at him. Here, let me check you out. I can smell burning. The burning smell got stronger, but I couldn't so much as see a singed hair on Persnickel. When I saw a puff of smoke billowing past me, I turned around. The back door was on fire. I sprinted back to the house. Luckily, there was a hose right near the back door. I turned it on and hosed the flames. Thankfully, the fire went out rather quickly, but the door hadn't fared so well. Half of it was missing. The remains were black and emanated a hissing sound. Look what you've done, I said to Persnickel. You set the door on fire when you ran through the dog door with a lit candle. He grunted and waddled back inside. I didn't want to have a missing back door, not with a murderer on the loose. The whole thing made me uneasy. But who would I call? The only builder I knew had been murdered. I went back inside and checked that my altar was far too high for Persnickel to reach. Once I was satisfied with that, I googled door stores. They were all too far away, and I was sure they wouldn't get here in time. I decided to drive to the local general store and ask for a recommendation. I explained the situation to the lady at the general store. And you need a door today, she asked me. What sort of door do you need? Any door will do in an emergency, I said, but one with a dog door would be ideal. She looked around furtively and then whispered, You're the new arrival with the coffee machine, aren't you? Yes. I wondered why she asked. I'll make you a deal. My husband is handy. He's not a licensed builder or anything, but he's handy around the place. He's always home by five. I can call him and ask him to buy a door in town. If you go home and call me with the measurements as fast as you can, I'll tell him exactly what you need. That's fantastic, I said, scarcely believing my luck. Can he do it tonight? Yes, she said. He'll charge the cost of the door, plus $100 for his labour, and a thermos full of your coffee. Skinny lattes, enough to fill that thermos. She pulled a huge thermos flask from under her counter. Deal. We shook hands. I was thrilled. It seemed my plumbed-in coffee machine would get me a long way in this town. I hurried home, thankful that I owned a tape measure. I measured the doors and texted the measurements to her, along with a note that the dog door was for my wombat, so it needed to be a dog door that would suit a Labrador. A fat Labrador at that. She texted back that she had already spoken to her husband and it would be no problem. I relit my candles and kept a close eye on Persnickel. He sat at the altar, looking longingly up at the candles, but made no attempt to reach them. I would have to keep an eye on that wombat. No one had told me that he had a thing for lit candles. I had unpacked about half the boxes when there was a knock on the door. I opened it to see a tall, thin man. I'm Tom, Lavinia's husband, he said. I knew who he was as he was clutching a large door. That's so good of you, I gushed. Come with me. I showed him to the back door. He did a double take when he saw it. What happened here? My wombat stole my lit candle and ran through the dog door with it while it was still alight, I said. His jaw dropped open and he took a few moments to recover. Oh, was all he said. Well, let's see what we can do. He muttered to himself for a while as he took the other door off its hinges. The new door will fit nicely, he said, and I breathed a sigh of relief. I was also relieved that the dog door was big enough for Persnickel to get through. Thanks for doing it today, I said. I was worried about having a missing door, what with the recent murder in town. There was a murder here at your house too, just the other day, wasn't there? He said, yes. But they got the woman who did that, I told him. 
They haven't caught whoever murdered the woman from the retirement home. He waved a screwdriver at me. She wasn't well liked. Yes, I heard she was mean to everyone, including Julie Medina. I feel sorry for Julie, what with her old mother living with her so she can't leave town. He made some non-committal noises and concentrated on the door. It looked like I wouldn't find out any information about Julie. I wonder who could have murdered Ursula Hackles, I said loudly. He shrugged. Here, help me hold this door in place, would you? I thought I should stop being subtle. Who do you think murdered her? I asked him. Clara Swan, he said. Her husband was a big-time criminal, and word has it she was too. A most unpleasant woman, that one. I was taken aback. Clara? Granted, she's irritating, but surely she's harmless enough. He shook his head. Oh, I'm sure her son would get an awful shock if he knew what she was really like. She certainly pulled the wool over his eyes. It's amazing he turned out so well, what with having two criminal parents like that. Clara killed Ursula Hackles, you mark my words. You know, I haven't been in town long, but Oleander Blanche from the retirement home is a friend of mine. The police arrested her for Ursula's murder. Tom's expression was one of disgust. That's crazy. I don't know why they don't realise that Clara did it. Maybe she bullied the other residents so they won't dare speak against her. Do you think some of the residents know she did it? I asked him. He was making a dreadful noise with a screwdriver, so I didn't know if he heard what I said. However, as soon as he finished, he turned to me. It wouldn't be too hard for the police to find out. They could simply ask Theodora Forbes. I had never heard that name before. Who on earth is she? I asked him. You've heard of the CWA, the Country Women's Association, haven't you? He looked me up and down. I can see you're from the city. I wondered how he knew that. Yes, I've heard of them. They do a lot of handicrafts, don't they? Like embroidery, crochet and knitting. And they're very good at baking. He nodded. They also do a lot of volunteer work. They volunteer in hospitals, taking around magazines and things like that. And they volunteer at the retirement home. Why did you think Theodora would know something? Was that her name? Theodora? He nodded. Theodora Forbes. She volunteers at the hospital. She volunteered in the kitchen the day that Ursula Hackles was murdered. The kitchen? I could scarcely believe my ears. Anyone working in the kitchen had the opportunity to poison Ursula Hackles' food. Did this Theodora person get on well with Ursula Hackles? He shrugged. Did anyone? Still, I think they were firm friends, as much as anyone could be friends with that woman. He tapped the door. There. Now, how about that coffee? Chapter 12 I still hadn't remembered to buy any eye sleep masks, a fact I remembered as soon as I woke up again at five the following morning. I grabbed my phone and looked at my weather app. It said that the sun rose at 4.45am in East Bucklebury. Why, that was positively uncivilised. In Melbourne, the sun rose much later than that. I was going to make a list. Eye sleep masks and block out interior roller blinds were at the top of that list. I would have to stop telling myself that and actually take action. I supposed that one positive out of waking so early would be that I wouldn't miss any early morning appointments. The negatives of waking so early were too numerous to mention, not least because I was having a gorgeous dream about beaches, back rubs and pina coladas. A few hours later, I collected Athanasius. You look nice, I said as he got into the car. He was dressed in a dark grey suit, a crisp white shirt and a checked bow tie. I could see my reflection in his black shoes. Thanks. Would you like me to drive? I know the way. No way, I shrieked before I caught myself. I amended that to, no thanks. I'll have to drive to Southport for work soon, so I might as well get used to driving there. I flashed what I hoped was a winning smile at him. Nevertheless, he did appear to be somewhat offended. Do you want to go on the M1 
or the Gold Coast Highway? He asked me. I shrugged. How would I know? I was lucky to make it here in one piece in the first place. Well, then, we should take the scenic route, the Gold Coast Highway. Hang on a moment. The scenic route won't take us hours out of our way and involve sharply winding roads without guardrails next to precipitous cliffs, or maybe deserted dirt roads that stretch on forever? I asked him, thinking of the so-called scenic routes around most of Australia. He laughed. No, nothing like that. The M1 is very busy. The Gold Coast Highway is somewhat less so, but it takes longer. Actually, you won't quite reach the Gold Coast Highway, I meant you have the choice of going near the water's edge or going on the M1. He was being as confusing as usual. Well, going near the water does sound better. It's all broad water as far as Southport, he said, but you'll drive past lots of nice canals and you'll see some lovely homes on them. Okay, then let's go. You direct me. It turned out that Athanasius was quite a good navigator, much to my surprise. We hadn't gone far before I began to enjoy the drive. The houses were quite picturesque, a mixture of old homes with brand new homes, and most of the older homes had been entirely renovated. How much further is it? I asked him when we reached a place called Labrador. What a nice name. I like Labradors. If I didn't have a wombat, I would probably get a Labrador. Southport is the next suburb, he said. We're almost there. I shot him a look and saw that he looked worried. Is something wrong? We're not lost, are we? He shook his head. No, nothing like that. It's just that I don't know where to park. It will be impossible to park outside the building, so we might have to park a fair distance away. But isn't it the main courthouse at the Gold Coast? I asked him. There must be parking nearby. He shrugged. I suppose there is. I just don't know where it could be. I was thinking on this when he suddenly exclaimed, Turn right, and then take the first turn left. I did as he asked, and soon found myself outside an impressive, modern, white and glass building with large metal letters that read Southport Courthouse. I drove past it as slowly as I could, but I couldn't see any available parking. What will I do? Go around the block? No, we'll park at Australia Fair. It's a big shopping centre nearby. There should be plenty of parking there. I followed his directions and came to a brick building with a dismal and dark and entirely claustrophobic car park. I did one lap inside the lower level in the car park and couldn't find a parking spot. Five cars nearly backed into me and a further five cars nearly rammed me from behind. I'm getting out of here, I shrieked as I took the first exit. Athanasius sighed. Go right and head for that parking centre there. It's out in the open. I thought I wouldn't be able to find a parking spot where he indicated, but I finally did. I paid the machine and we were on our way, on foot, sad to say. The courthouse was much further away than I had thought. It hadn't seemed quite so far in the car. Ouch, my feet hurt, I complained after I walked about a kilometre. Why didn't you wear sensible shoes? Athanasius asked me. These are my sensible shoes, I said in protest. What are you talking about? By the time we got to the courthouse, I was sweating and my feet were killing me. Athanasius took me by my arm. We're late now. Come on, Goldie. I need a bathroom break, I told him and followed the signs. When I returned, he said, follow me. I found out what courtroom Oleander will be in. Did you find out what time she's on? I asked him. He shook his head. No, I only know the order. Oleander is number five. We're late, and I found out that the second person is in there now. He made to move to the courthouse door, but I caught his arm. Are we allowed in there? We have nothing to do with this case. Yes, we can sit in on any or all of the sessions so long as we don't write anything, Athanasius said. Follow me. I followed him into the courtroom, which I had expected to be packed, but was only about half full. Athanasius and I sat in the back row. The magistrate was currently reading out a list of someone's crimes, which included drug dealing and skipping bail. 
I was surprised when the person got a good behaviour bond. Despite the fact that the judge sternly warned the man that he would only give him one more chance, I found the whole thing rather lenient. I leant across to Athanasius. I don't know the first thing about the law, but I don't think this is a hanging judge, I said. Athanasius nodded. This, in fact, is a lenient magistrate, a man's voice said. Mind if I sit with you? I looked up to see Detective Max Grayson. Athanasius spoke before I could. Please, have a seat. As Max sat down next to me, his elbow brushed mine, sending electric tingles through my body. I silently berated myself. What was wrong with me? Max might appear nice on the outside, but he had wronged poor Henry. I warned myself not to be taken in by his manners and his looks. And, oh, did he look good in that suit. I had only seen him in casual clothes before. I quite liked men in uniform and men in suits. Don't ask me why. There was just something about them. At any rate, I thought I should look forward rather than staring at him. What are you doing here? I asked him in a low tone, averting my eyes. I know Oleander, he said. Yes, you know her, but are you friends? I asked him. When he didn't respond, I added, Are you investigating her case? No, I'm officially on leave, so I'm not allowed to investigate any cases. So why the interest then? I asked him. Why are you investigating, I mean not investigating, Ursula Hackle's murder? I know the two detectives on the case, he said, and don't quote me, but I have concerns about their competence. No one else would have arrested Oleander. The next person was brought in, and a hush fell over the courtroom. We had to sit through two more cases until Oleander showed. I had expected I would be immeasurably bored, but I was pleasantly surprised. I found the proceedings interesting, although some cases were more dry than others. With case number four, the magistrate made some cutting remarks to the defence lawyer, stating that the lawyer had clearly made a deal with the prosecutor, so the magistrate's hands were tied. I hope it doesn't put him in a bad mood for Oleander, I said to Athanasius. No, this magistrate isn't too bad at all, Max whispered to me. I shivered at the touch of his warm breath on my cheek. The fourth case dragged on and on, and I was thoroughly bored by the time it came to its conclusion. Oleander was next. I was worried that they would break for lunch, but that was not the case. Oleander was brought in. She looked as though she had lost weight in the short time since she had been arrested. My heart went out to her. Athanasius gave a little jump beside me. The magistrate read out the case as he had with the previous cases. I was relieved when the police prosecutor said she did not oppose bail. Athanasius gave me the thumbs up. The magistrate said something in legal jargon, which I interpreted to mean he thought the police case to be quite tenuous. I made a mental note to ask Athanasius about that later. Oleander's lawyer stood up and made a speech about why Oleander should be granted bail, and then it was all over in an instant. The judge granted bail and imposed the bail conditions that Oleander had to report to the police station once a week and that she was not to speak with any witnesses. Are there any witnesses? I asked Max. Not as far as I know, he whispered back. I expected Oleander would be able to leave the courtroom with us, but she was escorted out a side door. Athanasius took my arm and hurried me out of the courtroom. Why did they take her away? I asked him in a panic. She will need to be processed, sign papers, stuff like that, Max said. It will take a few hours. A few hours? I asked him. Isn't that a bit excessive? He shrugged. It's always the way. At any rate, the magistrate was clearly surprised that Oleander was arrested. If it does end up going to trial, I'm sure those detectives won't have a leg to stand on. They'll make fools of themselves. I just hope they're looking for the real murderer. So do I, I said. Max excused himself and disappeared around the corner. Where will we wait for Oleander? I asked Athanasius. I expect at the front of the building. She'll have to go out there at some point. As we were going down in the lift, a well-dressed woman spoke to us. You're friends of Oleander Blanche's, aren't you? 
We both nodded. I wouldn't go out the front door if I were you, she said. There are reporters out there waiting to question you. What should we do? I asked her. Go out the back way, she said. They won't be expecting you to leave by the back way. We're actually waiting for Oleander to be processed, I told her. Do you know where that would be? She nodded. I'll draw you a little map of where to go. She fished in her handbag and pulled out a notepad from which she ripped out a piece of paper. She scribbled on it with her pen and then handed it to us. We both thanked her profusely. When we found the place, we sat outside waiting for Oleander to come out. She ended up taking more than two hours, and I felt as though I would faint from hunger. When she appeared, I was worried about her. Her face was white and drawn and had a pinched appearance. Athanasius hurried over to her and hugged her. Are you all right? She shook her head. The watch house was absolutely appalling. Her voice broke. What's the watch house? I asked her. It's where they keep people when they are awaiting bail, she said. It's like a dreadful jail that you'd see on a bad movie. I had to share a tiny cell with another prisoner, and neither of us had pillows. She asked for pillows for both of us, but they wouldn't give us any. The food was dreadful. The bed was so narrow, and the mattresses were only an inch thick. There were bars everywhere, and cages. It wasn't like a normal jail. It was an absolute nightmare. I thought she was about to burst into tears, but she somehow rallied. Have you found out who murdered Ursula Hackles yet? I hated to admit that we didn't. How about we buy you lunch and we can tell you what we've found out about the case so far, Athanasius said. Lunch sounds good, said a voice from behind me. Chapter 13 And what did you find out? I turned around and almost stepped into Max. Um, uh, I stammered, not wanting to let him know we were looking into the case. I wondered if he was psychic, because he at once said, Look, there's no use pretending. I know you're looking into the case. I shot Athanasius a glance. He didn't say anything, so I followed his lead and remained silent. Why don't I take you all to lunch, and you can tell me what you found out? You don't have to do that, I began, but he interrupted me. It will be doing me a favour. Oleander, I've been doing some investigating on my own, but I can't admit to it because I'm officially on leave. If those detectives found out, I'd be in a whole bunch of trouble. Why don't we compare notes? And I'm sure you want some decent food after being in the watch house. That's for sure. Oleander said vehemently. I nearly pointed out that she was going to get decent food, whether or not Max paid for it, but I thought that might appear childish. I know a good restaurant in Surface Paradise, he said. Where are you parked? I groaned and looked at my feet. A long way from here. I pointed in what I thought was the general direction. Why don't you all come in my car, and then I can drop you back at your car, Goldie? I jumped at the chance. My feet were already sore, and I had been dreading the long walk back to the car park. Will we need to put more money in your car? Athanasius asked me, referring to the public parking payment scheme. I shook my head. I couldn't figure out how the machine worked. It's not like the ones in Melbourne. I paid until ten tonight. I was embarrassed when they all laughed. All right, then. Follow me to my car, Max said. And if those detectives ever ask you, Oleander, we're the best of friends. I'll agree to anything for a good feed, she said. I'm easily bored. I was relieved that Max's car was quite close to the courthouse. I supposed being a cop, even an off-duty cop, had its privileges. We drove further into the city, and I was happy to play the tourist from the back seat. Oleander was in the front with Max, and I looked out over the scenery. While I didn't see the beach from the road, we did cross several bridges. I saw the canals with magnificent homes on the waterfront and luxury yachts moored in front of them. This is surface paradise, Max told me over his shoulder after he parked. We all piled out and he put money in the parking meter. I hoped the restaurant wasn't too far away. The restaurant isn't far away, Max said, and I shot him a look. I was really beginning to think he might be psychic. 
There was something otherworldly about him. No matter how slightly I felt it, I was certain there was just something about him, only I couldn't put my finger on it. The restaurant was only a block away and was busy, although not overly so. We sat around the table, Max diagonally opposite me. Athanasius was sitting next to me, and Oleander was directly opposite me. I need to eat something right now before I even look at the menu, she said with shaking hands. Did they feed you at all? I asked her. The food was very basic, she said, plus weak cups of tea and no coffee at all. I pulled a face. That's awful. The restaurant was dimly lit with a goldfish tank on the reception desk and paper fans hung across the red walls. I was thankful for the lighting. I knew it wasn't the time to be thinking about appearances, but I couldn't help thinking that Max looked cute, despite the fact I knew he was a terrible person. I might have been a murder-solving sea witch in sensible stilettos, but still, I was only human. I turned my attention to the food and decided on the Malaysian satay, while Oleander ordered three menu items. Are you sure you can eat all that? Athanasius asked her in concern. I'm sure I can, she said, her hands still shaking. And coffee. I didn't have coffee the whole time I was in the watch house. I thought I was going to die from withdrawal. But you didn't have coffee on a regular basis until Goldie arrived in town the other day, Athanasius pointed out. She shot Athanasius a dark look. I'm in the habit now. No one talked about the case until our food arrived. Oleander shoveled it in so fast that I was worried it would make her sick. Now, what did you find out? Max asked us. Athanasius and I exchanged glances, and I raised one eyebrow in query. He got my meaning at once. I think we can tell him everything, Goldie, he said. I nodded. I then realized that we had trespassed on Julie Medina's property, so I hastened to add, if we did something illegal, do you still want to hear about it? Max looked shocked, but soon recovered his composure. Did it involve murdering anyone? I wasn't sure whether or not he was joking, but I said, No, of course not. Nothing like that. He smiled. All right, then. I want to hear about it. You won't arrest us or anything, will you? I said. He held up both hands, palms outwards. No, feel free to tell me. I didn't arrest you for owning a coffee machine, did I? I nodded to Athanasius. Goldie and I found out that Julie Medina doesn't have a mother, at least not an ailing mother who is living with her, he said. There was a choking sound, and I looked up to see Oleander choking on her coffee. When you said that, I inhaled my coffee, she said after coughing. Are you sure? Julie has talked about her mother for a long time. I shot a look at Max and then said, when she went out, Athanasius and I looked through all her windows and there was no sign of any mother. Maybe she was out at the doctor's surgery, Oleander offered. I shook my head. No, we thought of that. There is one master bedroom, there's a room that is used as an office, and there is a room that is used as a spare room, plus there's a storage room. The spare bed has storage boxes on it and there's so much storage in the room that no one would be able to live in there. It looks as if it's been that way for a long time. Oleander looked shocked, but then resumed slurping her coffee at a fast rate. And what's more, Julie is having an affair, Athanasius said. Luckily, Oleander didn't inhale her coffee this time. Really? she said. With whom? Athanasius and I both shrugged. We don't know that, I said, but we overheard her speaking on the phone to someone. We only heard one side of the conversation. It was clear that he wanted her to keep their secret. We don't have any idea what their secret is, I said, before someone asked me about it. Their secret, Max repeated, speaking for the first time since we told him about Julie. I wonder what it could be. Goldie and I have thought about it and haven't come up with anything, Athanasius said. But the mystery man was expected for dinner that night and rang to say he couldn't come. She was quite angry and threw things around after the conversation ended. She had been planning to make him a big dinner, and he was supposed to stay the night. 
If their affair had to be kept a secret, then it sounds as if he's married, Max said, looking off into the distance. Or maybe their secret is something else. I nodded. Yes, we thought of that. Athanasius asked around at the retirement home to see if anyone knew anything about Julie's mother. And did anyone know? Max asked him. Athanasius shook his head. Goldie and I mentioned it at the funeral, but we haven't come across anyone who has actually met Julie's mother. We're beginning to think the mother was a cover for something else. Think carefully, Athanasius and Oleander, Max said. What exactly did she say about her mother? I don't mean recently. I mean at any time. Oleander stopped eating for a moment. She said her mother didn't like anyone coming to the house because visitors upset her. Max nodded slowly. So clearly there's something going on at her house that she doesn't want anyone to know about. We didn't see any boxes of drugs or evidence that she was making or dealing in drugs, I said. The house didn't look like it was part of a home business, legal or otherwise. There was that big shed out the back, Athanasius said. That's all certainly a cause for suspicion, Max said. It doesn't necessarily mean she's the murderer, though. I agreed. And Athanasius and I found out something about Harriet Hemsworth. Oleander set down her fork with a thud. Not Harriet. She seems so nice. That's what the neighbours of serial killers always say, Athanasius said sagely. Haven't you ever watched interviews on television when they interview the neighbours of serial killers? Everyone says the serial killer seemed nice and normal, a regular person. Oleander shrugged and went back to eating. What about Harriet? Max prompted me. Harriet admitted it herself at the funeral yesterday, I told him. She said she used to be a naturopath. I've just lost my appetite, Oleander said in a loud voice. That dreadful folder of hers. You can't imagine. I can imagine, believe me, I said. She took that folder to the funeral with her for safekeeping. To Max, I said. Ursula Hackles was one of her clients. I imagine this was some years ago. Anyway, they had a major falling out, and Ursula was instrumental in getting Harriet struck off. She wasn't able to practice as a naturopath after that. She lost her livelihood. What? Harriet never told me any of this, Oleander said crossly. I know she used to be a naturopath, but I knew nothing about the rest of it, or of her knowing Ursula for that matter. I'll bet Ursula added extra powdered milk to that dreadful instant potato to make Harriet sick. I nodded. Harriet said the same thing. She said she had no idea that Ursula was working there, or she wouldn't have bought into the retirement home. She certainly has a motive. Yes, but the strange thing is that she admitted it to us, Athanasius said. That's hardly the action of a murderer. Max leant back in his chair and folded his arms over his chest. To the contrary, that is precisely what a murderer would be likely to do. It could be a clever ploy. She would know the police would find out, so she could preempt that by admitting to it and making herself look innocent. That's good information, Goldie. And since we're sharing information, Max, what information do you have to share with us? I fixed him with a steely look. He shifted in his seat uncomfortably. After an interval, he said, I found out that Theodora Forbes is Ursula Hackle's heir. I was glad I hadn't been drinking coffee at the time. You're kidding, I said. Oleander stopped eating, and Athanasius's jaw fell open. How did you find out that? He asked him. Max made a zipping motion across his mouth. I can't reveal my sources, but Theodora Forbes is Ursula Hackle's heir. I gasped. Was there much money involved? Because if so, I think we might have found the murderer. Max leant across the table. What do you mean? Well, yesterday Purse Nichols set the house on fire. I would have said more, but everyone gasped in unison. He did what? Oleander shrieked. I waved one hand in dismissal. Not the whole house, I said. Just the back door. I had a candle on the coffee table, and when I set it alight, Persnickel grabbed it and ran out the back door with it.
He went through the dog door, and the candle set the door on fire. Anyway, this is all beside the point, but I got some guy called Tom to replace it. His wife runs the little corner store in town. Let me guess, Max said dryly. You bribed him with coffee. I nodded. Anyway, he told me that Theodora is a volunteer for the Country Women's Association, and she was volunteering in the kitchen the day that Ursula was murdered. Max leant back in his chair and let out a low whistle. Wow. It doesn't mean she did it, Athanasius said, but it sure is a nice piece of information. Do you know how much money was involved? I asked Max. Was Ursula wealthy? Max shrugged. I have no idea, but I'll find out. Theodora's husband ran off with his secretary recently, and she's fallen on hard times, Oleander informed us. She's been a great volunteer, but she's never worked a day in her life. Her husband cleaned out their joint bank account. This inheritance has come at a good time. We don't know how much money is involved, Athanasius said. Oleander shrugged. Something is better than nothing. I suppose Ursula Hackles had to leave her money to someone, and she wasn't likely to leave it to her estranged brother, Athanasius said. Theodora would be as likely a person as any. Tell me more about Theodora, Max said. Athanasius tapped his chin. I didn't think she particularly liked Ursula, though. What do you mean? Max asked him. I think I'm going to be sick. Oleander clutched at her stomach. I pushed a glass of water across the table to her. Here, sip this slowly. She eyed the water askance. I can't fit anything else in, not even a sip of water. To distract her, I asked Athanasius, Why do you think Theodora didn't like Ursula? She did like her, Athanasius. It's just that they had a falling out over Theodora's Christmas present from Ursula, Oleander said, tapping her chin. Theodora always said she liked Ursula's perfume. It was a particularly expensive French perfume. I can't remember the name of it. Can you, Athanasius? He shook his head. I'm not interested in perfume. Oleander spun the glass of water. Oh, well. Anyway, Ursula bought her this terribly expensive French perfume for Christmas. Only one of the nurses noticed it was a different colour from the real stuff. The nurses figured out that Ursula had simply given Theodora one of her old bottles and put cheap perfume in it. It didn't smell anything like the real thing. Was Theodora angry? Max asked her. She was livid with rage, Oleander said. They had a screaming fight about it, and Ursula Hackles called her an ungrateful little... Well, I can't repeat what she said, but they had a terrible fight, and rather mean words were exchanged. Then why did Ursula leave all her worldly goods to Theodora? I asked her. Oleander held up both hands, palms upwards. Ursula was always having a screaming match with someone. She probably thought nothing of it, and the two did become friends again after that. Giving someone cheap perfume hardly seems a motive for murder, Max said. That's because you're not a woman, I said. He winked at me. Oh, you've noticed. Chapter 14 I came home to find the lock on my front door broken. I didn't suspect foul play. It was an old house, after all, and things on old houses were constantly falling to pieces, such as picture hooks clattering to the floor and gutters dropping their leaves into the garden. Still, I couldn't take the chance that someone would break in. I called Tom and bribed him with more skinny lattes. He said he would be there the following morning. My main concern was leaving Persnickel alone in the house while I went on my date with Henry. How could I get information out of the good doctor if I was worried about my fuzzy little roommate running riot through the garden, or worse, the town? The backyard was securely fenced, but the front yard was not fenced at all. I figured I could put on an episode of Starsky and Hutch to keep him occupied, but who knows how long I would be. I slipped into a slinky red dress, the kind which made it look like I had a bum, 
and a pair of towering red stilettos. I thought an idea would come to me, but then it was an hour later, and Henry was standing at my front door, holding a dozen pink roses. Thank you, one second, I said, putting the flowers on the hall table and pulling on my coat. Did you forget something? he asked. Yes. Lipstick? he wondered aloud. Nope, I said, tottering through the house. Maybe I should have worn shorter heels. Who was I kidding? Goldie Bloom in appropriate footwear? That would be incredibly off-brand. Phone? That's in here. I patted my handbag. Keys? No. Ah, here you are, I said, pulling Persnickel out of the potted plant. Henry gasped. You're bringing your wombat? Yes, I said triumphantly. On a first date? Would it be any weirder on a second date? Probably not, Henry shrugged. Will the restaurant even allow him to come in? We'll just say he's a guide dog for the blind. Henry frowned deeply. He's not a dog, and neither of us are blind. I slipped on a pair of dark sunglasses. Oh, Henry, I think the doctor doth protest too much. Henry and I arrived at the restaurant, dragging Persnickel behind us on a lead. He wasn't too happy about being hauled from his nice, comfy spot in front of the television, but when he saw the number of potted plants in the restaurant, he perked right up. Here you are. Our waiter glanced down at Persnickel. I'll be back shortly with the wine list. Oh, good, I can't wait to read it, I said. The waiter raised his eyebrow. I adjusted the sunglasses on my face. I mean, I can't wait for Henry here to read me what is, I'm sure, a very fine selection. This is the strangest date I've ever been on, Henry said, but he was smiling. This isn't even on the list of my top ten strange dates, I replied. Ouch. Henry bent over to rub his ankle. I think your wombat just bit me. He's grumpy. Give him your spoon to nibble on. Is it safe to give a wombat a spoon? I think these are real silver. Henry looked at his reflection in the spoon. He's a wombat, not a werewolf. I'm sure it's fine. Henry put the spoon on the ground while our waiter came back with the wine list before he shuffled off again to show another couple to their seats. When I saw who that other couple was, my stomach turned to a giant knot for reasons I wasn't sure of myself. It was Detective Max Grayson, and he was on a date with a pretty woman. Ignore that, a very pretty woman. She was small and bare-faced and was wearing comfortable shoes. Of course Max would like a woman like that, one who doesn't wear towering heels or bring wombats on dates. At that moment, I hated him and his beautiful face and his sensible choice in women. Goldie? Yes? I looked at Henry, while pretending I couldn't look at anything, because our waiter was now hovering near the desk, throwing shifty glances at Purse Nickel, who was slobbering over the spoon. Did you hear the wine list I just read out? I did, I lied. I want the one you read last. Okay, Henry said happily. Hey, dear old Max is here. Is he? I hadn't noticed, I replied stiffly. Max was looking over at our table, frowning. Frowning was perhaps too nice a word. Glowering is more like it. We should go say hi, Henry said. After everything he did to you? No. Let him have fun on his stupid date with that stupidly pretty woman in her stupidly sensible shoes. Actually, I think I might use the ladies' room. Hold on to Persnickel's leash, won't you? And please keep him away from Japanese peace lilies. Those are his favourite. I made my way to the bathroom, bumping into tables here and there for good measure. When I came out of the bathroom, Max was leaning against the wall, arms folded. He smelt like fresh cotton, and he was smirking. Just exactly what are you up to? He said. I'm on a date. Yes, I go on dates, thank you very much. With your wombat. What? You've never taken a wombat on a date? It's very in right now. Sure replied Max. Henry's a lovely man, isn't he? Of course, he is incredibly dull. I think he's very interesting. And horrible. And sweet, I countered. And the actual worst.
I think you'd be a little nicer to Henry after all the horrible things you did to him, I said, turning up my nose. After all the horrible things I did to Henry? You're foolish if you believe a single thing that man tells you. It's okay to be jealous, detective. Jealous? Max went bright red. It was sweet, actually. Even the tips of his ears went pink. Of all the ridiculous. Jealous. Me. Of Henry Swan. You really have lost your mind. Why are you wearing sunglasses inside, anyway? Do you think you're a celebrity all of a sudden? Just then the waiter approached. May I show you back to your seat, ma'am? It would be a pleasure to help. I'm sure Miss Bloom can make her way back to her seat on her own, Max said. I thought because of her condition. What condition? Insanity? Sir, I do not think it amusing to make fun of the visually impaired, the waiter said tersely. Maybe he wasn't so bad after all. The corners of Max's lips twitched. Ah, of course. Forgive me. Allow me to escort the lady back to her seat. He held out an arm for me, and I had to pretend not to see it. I knew you must be blind to go on a date with Henry, Max hissed in my ear as he walked me back to my table. Shut up. I'm trying to get information about the murder. I'm undercover, you know, doing actual police work. Well, seeing as you are, you know, not an actual police officer, I suggest you keep your nose out of this murder case. Max stopped walking then. I'm serious, Goldie. You have to be careful. Why do you care? Max went pale. Well, I'm a detective, aren't I? It's my job. I sat across from Henry. Ah, thank goodness I'm back in the company of a real gentleman. Henry, Max said curtly. Max, Henry replied far more warmly. Max scratched Persnickel under the chin and then returned to his seat. I glared at him as he apologized to the woman he was with, brushing her once across the shoulder. I could still feel the roughness of his shirt where my bare arm had sat on his arm as he escorted me back to my table. So, Henry, I said, folding the napkin into my lap, tell me about Julie Medina. Julie Medina, Henry said pleasantly, what do you want to know? I'm just curious about her mother. I'm a little nosy, and I've just moved here from a big city. I'd like to know about everyone in the town. Of course you do. Let's see. Julie's mother is a lovely woman. Are you her doctor? Oh, no. But you have met her. Many times, Henry said. He took a sip of wine. Excellent choice, Goldie. This wine is superb. The fruity bouquet. I interrupted. Sure, does Julie's mother live with her? She does, replied Henry. Ouch! I stuck my head under the table. Persnickel, I hissed. Stop biting Henry on the ankle, or there'll be no Starsky and Hutch for you for at least a week. Persnickel growled. At least, I think he growled. It was hard to tell. Oh, look, Henry said. Max wasn't on a date after all. I looked over to see a man kiss the woman at Max's table on the lips and take a seat beside her. So I was jealous over nothing. Not that I was jealous, of course. It was only arrogant Detective Max Grayson. Who'd ever have a crush on him? Shall we order? Henry read the menu to me loudly, no doubt so that the waiter could hear. We got through dinner and half of dessert without an issue, when I suddenly noticed Persnickel was gone. I'd been so caught up in Henry's stories about his days as a young man breaking noses on the rugby field that I'd forgotten all about my roommate. I'd forgotten all about him, that is, until I heard an elderly woman shriek, Rat! And there's a huge rat in my purse! Persnickel had padded across the restaurant and dug his head into the elderly lady's purse, thinking her flower print wallet was actual flowers. He chewed straight through the material and was starting on her ten dollar notes. Persnickel, I cried, whipping off my sunglasses and running across the restaurant. Get out of there! I thought you were blind, the waiter snapped. Get that dog out of here. You will never be welcome in this establishment again. We can explain, Henry raised his hands. The waiter put his hands on his hips, 
Get out. Sir. I turned. Max stood behind me, flashing his police badge. Sir, this is an official police wombat. Wombat? The waiter turned bright pink. I thought this was a guide dog for the blind. He's undercover. One of the best police wombats the force has ever seen. Max explained. On behalf of the force, I'd like to thank you for your outstanding service. Your commitment to upholding the moral standing of society is second to none. Why, thank you. The waiter looked confused, yet pleased. If you'll excuse me, the wombat and I need to debrief back at the station. Max clipped the leash under Persnickel's collar and took him from the restaurant. I found the pair of them in the car park. Thank you, I said. What's that? A thank you from Goldie Bloom? You're not unwell, are you? Just take the thank you, I said, though I couldn't help but smile. What Max had just done was a little dashing. So you're not on a date then? Nope. Third wheeling with friends from work. Are uh, you and Henry... Goldie? I turned to see Henry striding towards me. I'll take you to your car, he said. I looked back at Max. He was looking at me intently. Thanks again, I said. He nodded. I was about to follow Henry to the car park when Max touched my arm. Neither of us spoke for a moment. We just stared into each other's eyes as the cars on the highway swooshed past. Be careful, won't you? I'm serious, Goldie. I did something that surprised myself then. I stood on my tiptoes and kissed Max on the cheek. We both blushed and stammered a goodbye, and I returned to Henry, standing beside my car, with the feel of Max's stubble on my cheek. What a night, I whispered to Persnickel, putting my feet up on the coffee table and pouring myself a glass of wine after I had said my goodbyes to Henry and come home. Nothing had been stolen, and I wedged a chair against the door. What a crazy night. Chapter 15 I was unable to sleep, so I ate five bowls of ice cream and hatched a crazy plan. It was either that, or watch yet another episode of Starsky and Hutch. Persnickel, too, was wide awake. I supposed going to the restaurant had him in a hyper mood. Persnickel, I said, would you like a ride in the car? He did his little wombat dance again. I had his harness on him and led him out to the car before I had second thoughts. Maybe it wasn't such a good idea to go to the retirement home to question Ursula Hackle's ghost again but I knew she was hiding something from me. I couldn't figure out why a dead person would want to hide something. Surely her motive for doing so wasn't as strong as her desire to have her murderer brought to justice. I was halfway to the retirement home when I suddenly realised that they might have security. I hadn't considered that before. If they hadn't employed a security firm before, surely they would have hired one after the murder. Still, it was too late to back out now. It was a dark moon, the perfect night for such a venture. I drove into the car park, figuring that any security officers would approach me then and I would have to make up an excuse on the spur of the moment. I didn't want to think up an excuse in advance because I thought that might manifest it. After all, I had read The Secret at least five times. I considered calling Oleander and Athanasius to alert them to what I was doing but I didn't want them implicated if I was caught. Besides, it was probably way past their bedtime. I got Persnickel out of the car and crept along past the courtyards where the residents took their morning tea. So far, so good. There was no sign of security. I was a little alarmed when I remembered that security guards, as well as police in Australia, carried guns. I certainly hoped any security guard on the premises would ask questions before shooting. I didn't encounter a soul as I crept around the building in the direction of Ursula Hackle's office. Going into the building was out of the question. I wasn't quite that daring, and the doors might have alarms on them. I sat in the lily-pilly bushes outside Ursula's office window. She didn't appear at once, but my heart was beating out of my chest. My mouth was dry, and my breath was coming in ragged gasps. I was on an adrenaline high, but I didn't enjoy it at all, not one bit. 
It was the most ghastly feeling. Persnickel, on the other hand, was happily eating lily-pilly leaves. His munching was so loud that I thought it would attract attention. Persnickel, can you summon Ursula Hackle's ghost? I don't know how this works. He looked at me for the briefest of moments, the pink buds of the lily-pilly bushes dripping out the sides of his mouth. He at once turned his attention back to munching. I shrugged. I was deciding how long I would wait when Ursula Hackles appeared in front of me. Have you solved my murder yet? She asked me. Not yet, which is why I'm here, I told her. Have you remembered anything that could help me? She shook her head. I've told you that Julie Medina did it. I told you that right from the start. I don't know why you're not looking for evidence. I have looked for evidence, I protested. And I found out that Julie doesn't have anyone living with her, so her story about an ailing mother is untrue. Still, I have to consider all the suspects. I decided to come straight to the point. Why do you deny putting powdered milk in Harriet's food? The ghost shimmered. I did not do it, she spat furiously. I don't know why you won't admit it, I said. You're dead, if you hadn't noticed and everyone knows you put fake perfume in the gift you gave Theodora Forbes. Where are you getting all this nonsense from? She asked me angrily. You're nothing but a gossip, and you said you were finding out who murdered me. Are you covering up for the murderer? I just don't understand it. She looked put out. What do you mean? I'm wondering if you're covering up a more sinister secret. I would have said more, but she vanished. At first I thought I had gone too far with my questioning, but then I saw a security guard walk around the side of the building with a torch. My blood ran cold and I broke out in a sweat. I huddled back against the cold brick wall of the building, holding onto Persnickel's leash. I tried to pull him under the bushes a little more, but then gave up when he wouldn't budge. Besides, I figured that any movement on his part would make a rustling sound. I could hardly see him with the lack of moonlight, but it appeared he had fallen asleep. I held my breath as the security guard walked past me. He was walking in a half-hearted fashion, as if he didn't expect to find anything amiss. If only he would keep that torch pointing straight ahead. Thankfully he did, but he stopped just past me and lit a cigarette. I wasn't sure if that was even legal, but I wasn't about to comment. I couldn't hold my breath any longer, so I tried to let it out as silently as I could. I hoped that Persnickel wouldn't wake up and munch heavily. The security guard stood there smoking for what seemed an age. If I hadn't been so afraid, I too might have fallen asleep. Finally, he moved away. I crept out under the cover of the lily pillies to see if he was out of sight, and he was. Ursula, I hissed. Ursula, are you there? There was no response. I huddled back under the lily pillies, hoping she would reappear. Who was she trying to protect? A lover? She didn't seem the sort to cover for a friend. Or maybe she wasn't covering for anyone at all. I rubbed my forehead and tried to think of an explanation for her actions. Perhaps she was simply embarrassed that she had put the powdered milk in Harriet's food and that she had given the fake perfume to her best and only friend. Still, if she was lying about such petty matters, then it was on the cards that she could be lying about bigger matters. This was getting me nowhere. My head was in a spin from going around in circles. I looked at my watch. It was almost midnight. I wondered if I should go home or stay here and wait a little longer for Ursula. After five minutes, she still hadn't shown, so I decided to walk around to her apartment. Maybe she haunted that more than her office if haunt was the right word. I was new to speaking with ghosts, and there was no one who could tell me. If only my uncle had taught me all this before he passed away. I wondered why he hadn't been in touch for years. I yawned widely, and then woke up Persnickel. He awoke with a start, and then immediately crunched on some leaves. We're going to Ursula Hackle's apartment, which I think is around the back, I whispered in his ear. He offered no response as usual, although he did grunt when I made him walk. I sneaked around the building, figuring that the security guard would be doing laps of the complex 
and wouldn't come back this way. I crept along the side of the building, sticking close to the lily pillies, and around the corner, right into a bulky figure. I screamed. A torch shone all over me. Who are you? A male voice asked. Who are you? I countered. I'm the security guard. You're trespassing. I'm not trespassing, and can you get that torch out of my eyes? He lowered his torch. I'm Goldie Bloom, and this is my therapy wombat. He's already had one session at the retirement home, and I'm trying to familiarize him with the property. It's all part of the therapy wombat program. You're kidding, the security guard said rudely. Anyway, even if what you say is true, and I very much doubt it, what are you doing here in the middle of the night? Wombats are nocturnal, I said, not having the slightest clue whether they were or not. I knew nocturnal animals were active and awake at night, but Persnickel slept both day and night, so I had no idea what category he fell into. Yes, wombats are nocturnal, I said again slowly, trying to buy myself time to think up a better story. I brought him here through the day, but he's been sleepy, so I needed to bring him back to familiarise himself with the place in the night. Did you get permission? He snapped. Yes, from Ursula Hackles, I said, but she's dead. Still, she gave me permission. I didn't know if I should get permission from her successor, but as one has not been appointed yet, I thought I should go about my duties. I hope you realise I'm not being paid for this. I'm a volunteer. I do this out of the goodness of my heart, and I don't get any financial reward. I tried to stare him down as I said it, which was difficult given that it was dark. That seemed to put him on the back foot somewhat. Oh, yes, volunteers are necessary. Is there anyone who can vouch for you? Athanasius Chadwick Pryor and Oleander Blanche have assisted me with the wombat's initial training. I told him, you could call them and ask. I'll do that. Please accompany me to the security office. I had no choice but to follow him to the office. It was a tiny office, no bigger than a laundry room, and simply had a small wood and iron table, a desktop computer, a landline phone, and a stack of dark blue folders. The room reeked of cigarette smoke and sweat. The security guard punched some keys into the landline phone and then said, Mr. Chadwick Pryor? Yes, I'm sorry to trouble you at this time of night, but I have a... He looked at me and said, Name? Goldie Bloom. Goldie Bloom, he continued, who alleges she is training her therapy wombat in the dark. He said no more, because I figured Athanasius was speaking quickly. Oh, that's right, is it? I had no idea. She said she was given permission by Miss Hackles. Oh, that's right, is it? He spoke for a few more minutes and then hung up. I'm sorry to trouble you, Miss Bloom. We can't be too careful, not after the murder. No, you're only doing your job, I said. Mr. Chadwick Pryor asked if you would go to his apartment now with your wombat. He has a lemon tart for him. I don't know if wombats are allowed inside the premises, though. I looked at him archly. They most certainly are. Therapy wombats, that is, I'll have you know. You're not speciesist, are you? He looked alarmed. No, I'm not. What does that even mean? Someone who favours one species over another. Someone who assigns different rights to one species over another. I'm sure you're fully aware that therapy dogs are allowed inside the premises. So are you trying to tell me that therapy wombats are not? No. No, I'm not, he stammered. Certainly not. I'm sorry to detain you, Miss Bloom. With that, he got up and opened his door. I let Persnickel out. He seemed more awake this time, possibly as he had heard the words lemon tart. When I reached Athanasius's apartment, Oleander was walking down the corridor towards me. She put her finger to her mouth and nodded to Athanasius's door. I knocked, and Athanasius opened the door immediately. His smile was even wider when he saw Oleander. Come in, all three of you he whispered. I felt bad for waking Athanasius. He was wearing a tartan bathrobe over tartan pyjamas and was clutching a glass bottle of humbug lollies, black and white, aniseed-flavoured, hard-boiled lollies that had been a favourite of my grandfather's. 
Persnickel grunted and continued to do so until Athanasius fed him a lemon tart. I'm so sorry to wake you both up at this time of night, I said. Nonsense, Oleander said. I was unable to sleep. Anyway, this is exciting, having a midnight feast. It reminds me of the days when I was back in boarding school in Sydney. Yes, it is exciting, Athanasius said, stifling a yawn. What are you doing here, Goldie? Trying to speak to Ursula Hackle's ghost again? I nodded. I didn't want to tell you two about it, because I didn't want to implicate you if I got caught. She vanished when the security guard came, and I didn't get anything else out of her. She still insists Julie did it, but... Athanasius interrupted me. You don't believe her? I shook my head. No, I don't. I asked her straight out if she put powdered milk in Harriet's food, and she denied it again. I also asked her if she put cheap perfume in Harriet's gift, but she denied that too. Since she lied about such trivial things, I don't think she was telling the truth when I asked her who murdered her. I'm afraid I can't see your reasoning for once, Goldie, Athanasius said, rubbing his forehead. I mean, she's not being truthful, so what if her murder was a result of her doing something terrible to someone else? I think I can see where you're going with this, Oleander said slowly. You think she might have done something terrible to someone and was murdered as payback, and that's why she won't tell you about it, because she's embarrassed. Exactly, I said. She is obviously embarrassed that she put the cheap perfume in Theodora's gift, and she's obviously embarrassed that she put the powdered milk in Harriet's food. So she might be embarrassed about doing something terrible to the murderer. But what sort of thing could that be? Athanasius asked me. I shrugged. I have no idea. I think it was a revenge murder, Oleander said. She did something terrible to the murderer, and so the murderer killed her in revenge. I nodded. Yes, that's what I've been trying to say. Oh, and I almost forgot. I had dinner with Dr. Henry Swan earlier, and he said he has met Julie's mother. Oleander's mouth fell open. So she does exist after all. Is she a patient of his? I shook my head. He said she isn't. I looked back at Athanasius and Persnickel. They were both fast asleep, snoring lightly. Chapter 16 The following morning, after Tom fixed the front door, I was on my way to the Country Women's Association meeting. I had been told they would take all comers. Athanasius had awoken the previous night and advised me to dress in a suitable fashion, so I had dressed up for the occasion. He said the Country Women's Association ladies could be somewhat intimidating, but he hadn't lived in Melbourne. Intimidating? I really doubted it. I assumed this was a committee meeting, but Athanasius told me that there would be plenty of time to chat. My mission was to uncover information about Theodora Forbes, the heir to Ursula Hackle's fortune, or lack of fortune for all I knew. I had to find out exactly how much she was inheriting and whether or not she had a grudge against Ursula Hackles. In short, I had to discover whether she was a likely murderer. I pulled up outside an unremarkable white wooden building that was next to an old stone church. The women going in were all wearing sensible clothes, so I thought perhaps I had come to the wrong place. Nevertheless, I parked the car under the shade of a spreading banksia tree and got out, fanning myself with my sunglasses as I did so. The Gold Coast weather was far hotter than the Melbourne weather. It was going to take quite some getting used to. As I walked in the door, I was met by a burly woman who had better biceps than I had, despite all my years in the gym. And you are? She barked, but she was smiling. I didn't know whether she was passive-aggressive or just plain aggressive. I held out my hand. Good morning, I'm Goldie Bloom. When she shook my hand, she crushed my fingers. I tried not to wince, but she didn't release my hand when I attempted to pull it away. I am Theodora Forbes, she announced. I couldn't believe my luck, the very woman I wanted to see. It's lovely to meet you, I said, flashing all my teeth at her. 
This is my first meeting. I was told you accept all comers. She patted me so hard on the back that I tottered forwards. It's wonderful to have you, she said. The more the merrier. She looked me up and down. Where's your stuff? I was puzzled. My stuff? She nodded. Yes, your knitting stuff. Knitting? The very word filled me with horror. I thought this was a meeting of some sort. She smiled again. It is. It's a knitting bee. We're all knitting squares that will be sewn together to make quilts for people at various Gold Coast hospitals. I gulped. Oh, obviously you can knit, she said. How is that obvious? I asked her. Because anyone who joins the Country Women's Association can knit. I swallowed hard. Of course I can knit, I lied. Sadly, I didn't bring my knitting needles with me, or any wool. Was it even called wool, or was it called yarn? I hoped I hadn't slipped up. That's fine, we have plenty of spare knitting needles and wool. She escorted me into the room. I felt like a prisoner. I fought the urge to run out the door. Theodora introduced me to the other women. They all looked friendly enough, but they were all knitting furiously, their knitting needles clicking away ninety to the dozen. Come on, I'll get you some wool and some needles. Theodora pushed me into a seat at a round table, and I flung out my hands to prevent my head hitting the table. She sure was one strong woman. Luckily for me, my mother had taught me to knit, but I was seven at the time, or maybe ten. I couldn't remember back that far. I vaguely remembered how to cast on, but I certainly didn't remember how to cast off. I figured I would be able to manage some sort of rudimentary knitting. I sat there looking at the knitting needles. I would not have felt worse if I were in a dentist's chair. I was filled with dread. Thankfully, I managed to cast on. I noticed the other ladies looking at me, and I figured it was because I was working at one hundredth of the pace that they were working. Arthritis in my fingers from my job, I said. What's your job? The woman sitting opposite me asked. Real estate agent, I told her. Lots of typing. I stopped knitting as I spoke, but she was able to multitask. Her knitting needles moved furiously. I've just moved here from Melbourne and I start working at Southport in just over three weeks, I told her. She introduced herself as Mabel and introduced the ladies sitting closest to me, Joan, Lynette and Sandra. They all nodded slightly to me. I noticed that they had knitted several squares, whereas I was still on my third row. So you have arthritis, dear? Joan asked me. Yes, it's awfully painful, I said. I do hope I can finish a whole square before it's time to go home. Mabel nodded her approval. It's very good of you to make an effort. I shot her a weak smile. To my surprise and delight, Theodora sat next to me. Your knitting isn't even, she said in an accusatory tone. It's her arthritis, Theodora, Mabel snapped at her. Theodora's meaty hand clamped on my back. Oh, I'm so sorry. I had no idea that's why you're such a terrible knitter, and a slow one at that. I managed a weak smile, and she released my shoulder. I've heard your name somewhere, I said, hoping the woman wouldn't become violent at some point. Someone mentioned you to me the other day. Who was that? Theodora barked at me. I think it was someone at the retirement home, the East Bucklebury Retirement Home, I said. All those gossips. Theodora said. She did not seem the least concerned. The word is out that I'm Ursula's heir. I expect those oldies think I inherited a fortune. And did you? I fixed her a penetrating look. For the first time since I had met her, she looked uncomfortable. She clasped her fists together on the table. I haven't done too badly, but not as well as if I had won the lottery. She made a cackling sound. At first I thought she was choking, but then I realised it was her way of laughing. I certainly would not want to get on the wrong side of this woman. Well, it's always nice to inherit something, I said hurriedly, trying to keep on her good side. I only moved here a few days ago because my uncle left me his house and some money. I moved here from Melbourne. You know, it was quite a coincidence 
because the same day that my boss asked me to move to the Gold Coast to manage his Southport office, I found I had inherited the house here at East Bucklebury. I noticed all the ladies at our table were looking at me now, and I even had Theodora's interest. Yes, it is good to inherit something, she said. There's sadness, but there is also happiness. You know, I feel a bit guilty for being happy that I inherited something, what with poor Ursula being murdered and all that. Yes, that's exactly how I felt too, I said, hoping to keep her talking. I hadn't seen my uncle in years. I knew your uncle, she said. He was a good bloke. He kept to himself, mostly. He had friends at the retirement home. Oleander and Athanasius, I asked her. She nodded. They're good old sticks, really. I like most of the people at the retirement home. I mostly liked Ursula, too. She broke into a cackle again. Then she leant across and whispered conspiratorially in my ear. I wasn't too fond of her, to tell you the truth. Not all the time. We had a love-hate relationship, and that's why I feel guilty that I've inherited her money. You shouldn't feel guilty. She didn't have anyone else to leave it to. I regretted the words as soon as they were out of my mouth, but Theodora did not appear to take offence. Yes, she didn't much like her brother in England, or his horrible children, or his nasty trophy wife, for that matter. I was the only friend she had. Really? I said. I'd never met her, of course, but this seems such a friendly little town that I'm surprised she didn't have any friends. She was a right, she said, and the other ladies gasped at the use of her profanity. My eyebrows shot skyward. She was? Well, it's just as well she left all her money to you and not to some obscure charity. She struck me on the back. You're all right, you know. What's your name again? Goldie. Goldie Bloom. She laughed. What a strange name. But then again, I've never had much time for city folks. But you're all right, Goldie Bloom. This time she hit me so hard on my back that my head did hit the table. Chapter 17 After my epic fail of that morning at the Country Women's Association, I thought I should investigate Clara Swan. She was the only one of the suspects who had a criminal record. I wasn't even certain she herself had a criminal record, but her husband had been a crime lord, so surely she got her hands dirty at some point. I didn't know her motive, or even if she had one, but I thought I should find out. I hadn't made any progress in other quarters, unless, in fact, Julie Medina was the murderer. Since no one suspect was standing out, I figured I needed to come at it from a process of elimination. I would go to the retirement home at afternoon tea time to try to speak to Clara, and failing that, I would report on my dismal lack of success that morning to Athanasius and Oleander. Nevertheless, I had found out something namely that Theodora was a very strong woman. I didn't get the vibe that she was the killer, but what would I know? I hardly had experience in these matters. She certainly had a motive, but was it a strong enough motive for murder? Persnickel slept all through my lunch, so I decided to head to the retirement home and see if I could just happen across Clara. I didn't want it to look as though I was seeking her out. To my relief, Clara was sitting in the courtyard, she was speaking, or rather complaining, to a nurse. I only buy Italian shoes, she said, and these are size nine. Size nine, I tell you. I can't even get my foot into them. At least that's what you're telling me. Try harder, won't you? The poor nurse was crouched over at her feet, trying to ram Clara's large foot into a tiny shoe. I need a shoehorn. Go and get a shoehorn. The nurse hurried away. Even from where I was, I could see that no shoehorn was going to get that foot into that tiny shoe. She looked up and saw me looking at her. I always take size nine in Italian shoes, she said. These shoes cost my son a few hundred dollars, and they're size nine. My foot must fit. Her face was an angry shade of red. I sat next to her without being invited. So is that an Italian shoe too? I asked her. Of course it is, she snapped. I only wear Italian shoes. 
I looked at the shoebox, and it was plain that it was an Australian name, not an Italian brand. I wasn't about to tell her. Instead, I said, that's strange about the size discrepancy. I know why you're here, she snapped at me. Sit down and stop making small talk. I was already sitting down, so I was at a loss. Sit closer, I need to speak to you, she said in an imperious tone. I figured she was angry that she knew I was going to question her about Ursula Hackle's death. I heard you had dinner with my son last night. You heard? I asked her. She nodded and glared at me. If looks could kill. I have forbidden him to see you again, she snapped. What business is it of yours? I snapped back. She looked shocked. I wondered if anyone had ever spoken to her in that way before. She sputtered for a moment and then said, I know types like you are just after his money. I crossed my arms over my chest and for a moment forgot my mission. What do you mean by types like me? I asked her, fixing her with my best glare. Unsuitable women. How am I an unsuitable woman? You're not a doctor or a lawyer, are you? I'm a licensed real estate agent. What of it? She looked at me and hissed. If you're after his money, it won't do you any good. He doesn't have any. The nurse at this point returned with a shoehorn. That was silly of her. I thought she would avoid Clara for the rest of the day. Once more, she tried to squeeze the woman's foot into the shoe. Finally, she gave up. You're going to need another size. The next size up, Clara. I do not, Clara bellowed. I always take size nine shoes. I'd had enough of the woman's histrionics. Look, Clara, it's not rocket science, is it? It doesn't matter what size you say you are. The fact remains that these are size nine shoes. I stabbed my finger on the box. There's no way your feet are going to fit in one of those shoes, so I suggest you send them back and ask for a bigger size. The nurse shot me a grateful look. What a good idea, she said, snatching the box and putting the shoes in them. She was out of there before Clara could speak again. Clara glared at me for a while before speaking. Did you hear me just tell you before we were so rudely interrupted that Henry has no money? I'm not after anyone's money, I told her. I myself have just inherited some money. Hmm. She returned to sipping her tea. Why, this tea is cold. Nurse! Another nurse appeared. My tea is cold. Clara snapped. I pay enough for this place and you serve me cold tea. Replace it at once. The nurse sighed and removed Clara's teacup. Now, she began, but I interrupted her. I already heard you the first time. Your son has no money. She looked down her nose at me. He does have money, but only his own money that he makes as a doctor. He isn't in my will, and there is a sizable fortune in my will. Millions, in fact. I tried not to gasp. Millions? I squeaked. I suspected it was all from ill-gotten gains, but I kept that thought to myself. Yes, and Henry is not in my will. When I die, he won't get a cent. That's none of my business. What you do with your money is entirely up to you. I'm sure he'll contest it, though. She laughed. I've thought of that. I'm quite famous, or rather, should I say, infamous. And when I do depart this worldly existence, it will be all over the media. I've left it all to a charity, a particular charity for which there is considerable empathy. If he contests it, he is going to look awfully bad. Of course, if he marries a suitable woman, I will change my will and leave it all to him. Let me guess, I said. A suitable woman means a doctor or a lawyer? She nodded. Yes, a doctor or a lawyer who will give up her career for my son and have plenty of children. What century do you think this is? I asked her. She ignored my remark. I told him if I find out he's dating anyone unsuitable, I'll make sure he never inherits. Well, you don't have to worry about me, I told her. I am most certainly not dating your son. She was visibly relieved. Good. He doesn't have any money of his own. I know that, I said. I heard all about how he didn't get the inheritance from Mr. Grayson. 
Clara stopped eating butter shortbread biscuits and looked up at me. What rubbish are you talking about now, girl? I heard that Detective Max Grayson's father left a considerable sum of money to Henry in his will, but Max stepped in and prevented him from getting it. She laughed. What a fanciful tale that is. Nothing of the sort happened. By now I was thoroughly confused. Surely Henry had told his mother what had happened. Why would Max Grayson's father want to leave any money to Henry? I'm sure he didn't even like him, she said dismissively. I heard he was very fond of Henry and treated him as his son. Clara guffawed. Why, he didn't like him at all. He was kind to him, but then Henry stole money from him and broke Max's nose. It wasn't while playing rugby, I asked her. She thought that was even funnier. Henry was a sickly child. He never played rugby. You shouldn't be such a gossip listening to all this nonsense and repeating it. I tried to remember everything Henry had told me about Max. I was told that Henry lived with the Grayson family for a while. She waved her embroidered white handkerchief at me in dismissal. Yes, the Grayson family took in Henry when my husband and I were both imprisoned at the same time. I suppose they felt sorry for him. How did the two families know each other? I asked her. Figure it out for yourself. They were cops and we were criminals. Of course we knew each other. Oh, I said in a small voice. Yes, Henry always was a rather naughty little boy. I suppose my husband and I spoiled him. I was afraid that the Grayson family would turn him into a horrible little do-gooder like they were. Not that I wasn't grateful to them, mind you. But we did make him return the money he stole from the Graysons. It was good of them to take him in. I held up both hands, palms outwards. Okay, let me get this straight. Max Grayson's father didn't leave Henry anything in his will. Are you sure of that? Are you trying to say I'm senile? Are you trying to say I don't remember things clearly? Why are you asking me to repeat myself? I was rescued at that point because the nurse returned with the tea. Clara snapped at her. Take that tea bag out of it. You know I don't like tea bags left in my tea. I really can't stand incompetence. I wondered why someone hadn't murdered Clara by now. She certainly seemed a better prospect to be murdered than Ursula Hackles. I couldn't imagine Ursula Hackles being any worse than Clara. But then again, Ursula had power over the residents and was able to serve them horrible food and lock their possessions away. Before the nurse left, I asked her, Did you ever find the keys to that storage room of Ursula Hackles? She shook her head. Why don't you just get a locksmith? We were planning to, but it has to go before the committee meeting at the end of next month. They will approve it, of course, but we can't do anything until then. That's a shame, I said. I was very upset that Ursula died, Clara said. She was a lovely woman. We had many an interesting talk. She was the only one around here who would listen to me. I turned back to her. Really? You're the only person I've spoken to who had a good word for her. Clara sipped her tea, and for a moment I thought she had forgotten me. Ursula was very keen to hear of my life, she said. She was always asking me about my life and all about me. She was the only person who cared. No one else in here wants to know anything about me, and there was even a 60-minute story on my husband. Can you believe that? Yes, I shrugged, unsure how I should respond. She pushed on. All these other residents are too ignorant to want to know any details of my life. But Ursula, she was a different kettle of fish. She often invited me to her apartment for a cup of tea, and we would have lovely long talks. She was the only friend I had, and now she's gone. If you were such good friends, why then didn't Ursula leave anything to you? She left it all to Theodora, I said. I was expecting an angry reaction, but Clara popped a butter shortbread biscuit in her mouth and devoured it before speaking. She offered to leave it all to me, but I said I didn't need it. I have millions, after all. I thought I would die years before she did anyway. She told me Theodora was in her will. Theodora is harmless enough. I have nothing against the woman. So even though you were good friends with Ursula Hackles, you didn't care that she left her money to Theodora? 
Are you deaf, girl? I just told you that. And you got on well with Ursula Hackles? Stop repeating everything I've told you. You can go now. I'm no longer interested in speaking to you. And with that, I was dismissed. I was shaken by what Clara had told me about Henry and the Grayson family. Surely Henry hadn't lied to me. If he hadn't, then Clara had. One of them was a terrible liar. I decided to seek out Athanasius and Oleander. I found them readily enough in a shady courtyard. They were deep in conversation and both looked surprised to see me. How was your day? Oleander asked me. I went to the Country Women's Association meeting, as we planned last night, and they were all knitting. I stopped speaking to glare at Athanasius. I was sure he had known that, and the way he fidgeted and avoided my gaze only confirmed my suspicion. They made me knit, I added, and Oleander smothered a laugh. Long story short, I was sitting at the same table as Theodora Forbes, and she spoke as if she was quite fond of Ursula Hackles. She said nothing that would make me think she was the murderer. And I came back here, but just then I went to speak to Clara Swan. Did you find out anything from her? Oleander asked me. I nodded. I don't think it was anything pertaining to the case, but she said that Henry isn't in her will. They both gasped. Who has she left her money to then? Athanasius asked me. She would have millions. I nodded. Yes, she told me that she does. She hasn't left anything to Henry. She's left all her money to charity, and she said it will look bad if he contests the will. It's clearly only a tool to control him, because she said if he marries a suitable young woman, a doctor or a lawyer, then she'll change her will in his favour. That's probably why he hasn't bumped her off by now, Oleander said with a laugh. It's a wonder he hasn't found a suitable doctor or a lawyer by now, I said. I'm sure he won't be pleased if the millions pass to the charity. They both nodded. I pushed on. She also said that Ursula Hackles was a very good friend of hers. I relayed the whole conversation. By the time I finished, both Oleander and Athanasius had disappointed looks on their faces, as no doubt I did too. We really are no further ahead in the investigation, are we? Oleander said. Maybe we're missing something. Maybe we should look at this from another angle, Athanasius said. Like what? I asked him. Just then, Henry Swan strode over to me. Goldie, I need a word with you in private, right now. Chapter 18 I followed him over to stand under the shade of a pergola covered by grapevines. What is it? I asked him. My mother just told me she was speaking with you. What did she say? I thought fast. I came here to look for Oleander and Athanasius, and your mother called out to me and said she needed to speak to me. He looked concerned, but simply said, Go on. She was angry that we had dinner last night. He rubbed his head. What else did she say? She told me that you're not in her will, and that she has left all her money to charity, and that as soon as you marry a suitable, sensible woman like a doctor or a lawyer, she will change her will in your favour. He continued to rub his temples. Did she say anything else? Isn't that enough? I asked him. I did not want to broach the subject of the Grayson family. That would amount to calling him a liar to his face. Are you sure she didn't say anything else? Like what? I wondered why he was so keen to find out. Was there something I should have found out from Clara after all? It was obvious that Henry was worried his mother had told me something, but what? Surely he didn't suspect that his mother told me that Max Grayson's father hadn't left him anything in the will. He kept staring at me, so I added, She just said she was very good friends with Ursula Hackles. Go on, he said. She said that Ursula used to invite her over for a cup of tea and ask about her life. They had lots of long conversations. Did you say about what? I shook my head. No, she was quite upset because she bought some shoes and they were the wrong size. I'm not interested in shoes, Goldie. I want to know what else my mother told you. His tone was urgent. I shook my head. Nothing. 
What's this about, Henry? You seem upset that she told me something. I've told you everything she said. His manner at once changed to his usual charming self. He tapped my arm. I really must apologise for my mother, Goldie. I'm so sorry she said that to you. She's a very difficult woman. That's for sure, I said with feeling. Henry excused himself and left. I hurried back over to Oleander and Athanasius, pausing only to release my heel from where it had lodged between the pavers. What was all that about? Oleander asked me. It seemed as if the two of you were having a heated exchange. I sighed long and hard. I'm beginning to put two and two together, and I don't like what I'm coming up with. Let's not talk about it here, Oleander said. Let's go back to my apartment. Oleander's apartment was quite pretty, the wide glass doors opening onto the grassed area at the front. I have a private courtyard behind the house, she told me. Any time you want to bring Persnickel to visit, he's most welcome. He can't escape from the back area. I thanked her, and she indicated we should sit on her sofa. Wow, I love your apartment, I said. It was decorated in a Balinese style. Cane furniture, natural timber, and large planters filled with flourishing tropical plants. The dining table was set with bamboo placemats, a woven table runner, and wooden bowls. The scent of sandalwood incense hung heavily in the air, and wind chimes tinkled gently. I made a mental note to buy some, along with the block-out blinds and the eye sleep pads. My to-do list was growing. Would you like a cup of tea or a cold drink? She asked me. I'd like anything cold, please, I said, and Athanasius agreed with me. Soon the three of us were sitting, sipping lemonade. I haven't mentioned this to you before, but Henry Swan told me recently that he and Max have a long-standing, hostile relationship. He told me that he accidentally broke Max's nose while they were playing rugby, and that Max's father left Henry everything in the will, but because Max is a cop and has lawyer connections, Max was able to contest the will successfully and left Henry without a cent, even though that went against his father's intentions. Oleander and Athanasius both looked horrified. Why, that can't be true at all, Oleander said in disgust. I shook my head. I believed Henry at the time, but the subject came up with Clara, and she told me that it wasn't true. Now either she's lying or Henry's lying, but I can't see what possible motive Clara would have to lie about it. Besides, what she said made sense. I shook my head and rubbed my forehead to try to get my thoughts into some semblance of order. What's more, Henry kept asking me what his mother had told me. Was he concerned that she'd told you the truth about him and Max? Athanasius asked me. I shook my head. No. I'm sure it wasn't anything to do with that at all. He seemed more interested in her conversations with Ursula Hackles. It seemed that there was something that Clara knew about Ursula Hackles, and Henry wanted to know if she had told me. Whatever could it be? Oleander asked. I don't know, but I don't like where this is leading, Athanasius said. I nodded. Neither do I, and I can't believe we overlooked it until now. Whatever are you two talking about? Oleander set down her glass of lemonade on her table. We haven't looked at Henry as a suspect until now, I told her. Do you think Dr. Henry Swan murdered Ursula Hackles? She said. What possible motive could he have had? I shrugged. I don't know yet. Think about it. He certainly had the opportunity. He's a doctor who attends the residence here. He would have known that Ursula was allergic to codeine, and he could easily get his hands on codeine. But anyone can get their hands on codeine, Oleander pointed out. Until recently, it was available throughout Australia without a prescription. Most people in Australia would have it in their cupboards already. I had to concede her point. That's true. Athanasius tapped his chin. You know, if Henry was worried that his mother knew something... Whatever it was must tie in with his motive, assuming he did it, of course. You know what that means, don't you? Oleander addressed the question to me. No, I didn't like the sound of this. 
you have to go and get Pursnickel, and you're going to have to make Ursula Hackle's ghost tell you what she and Clara knew that no one else is supposed to find out. It could be the key to the whole murder. But it could be nothing, too, I protested. Oleander shook her head. We've been through all the other suspects. No one seems likely. Athanasius held up his hand. Julie Medina seems likely. I slapped my hand over my mouth. Oh, no, something just occurred to me. Out with it, Oleander said. What if Henry is the one having an affair with Julie Medina? Think about it. It fits. He can't let Clara know that he's dating Julie, or she will make sure he's never in her will. That could be what she was talking about. Oh, yes. And didn't he also tell you that he had met her mother? Athanasius said. No one else in the whole retirement home has seen Julie's mother. Henry must have been lying about that. Oleander nodded slowly. All the threads are coming together. You know, I'm beginning to think Henry murdered Ursula Hackles. I didn't know where this was going. I suppose I'll have to go home and get Persnickel. It's broad daylight. Will we pull the therapy dog trick again? They both nodded enthusiastically, and Oleander added, Just wait here. I have a surprise for you, Goldie. I hoped she would return with a box of chocolates or a bottle of nice wine, but my spirits fell when she came back into the room, flourishing a large piece of green material. Look what I've done. She held up the item, and I gasped. It was a green blanket with the words therapy wombat embroidered in gold. Why, that's beautiful, I said. How did you do that so quickly? Oleander looked pleased. I was up half the night. I thought we might need it. I couldn't get out of it now. I thanked her, accepted the therapy wombat blanket, and headed home to get Persnickel. All the while my stomach was churning. Henry seemed like a nice, honest person, but he had lied to me about Max. Could he have been joking, trying to put me off Max if he saw Max as a rival for my affections? Then again, he didn't seem too keen on having my affections in the first place. I really had no idea what was going on with the man. And did he murder Ursula? Or had Julie murdered Ursula and Henry found out about it later and so was protecting her? By the time I got home, I had a crushing headache from too much thinking. I hurried into the kitchen to take two Panadols. Persnickel opened one eye, looked at me, and then waddled over to the TV. A sure sign he wanted to watch an episode of Starsky and Hutch. Ride in the car, I said, and he did his happy dance. I slipped the harness on him, but decided to put the therapy blanket on him after we arrived at the retirement home, just in case he ate it on the way. It was green, after all. When I arrived at the retirement home, Oleander and Athanasius were waiting for me in the car park. I got out of the car and helped Persnickel out, while Oleander fussed over him, adjusting his therapy blanket. What will we do? Just march straight in there? I asked her. What if one of the nurses catches us and says we should make a booking? Oleander shook her head. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it, she said, words which did not give me a sense of confidence. Persnickel walked quite happily over to the main courtyard, where some of the residents were still having morning tea. There were gasps of delight when they saw him. To maintain my cover, and also to make the residents happy, I let him go to each one in turn and receive a pat. He clearly enjoyed the attention, and ate a potted plant or two on the way. The nurses also patted him. He's far more fun than that therapy dog, one of the residents said. I'll just take him for a bathroom break and bring him straight back, I promised the residents who all seemed sad to see him go. Oleander and Athanasius accompanied me in the direction of Ursula's office. This is where I spoke to her the other night, just near those lily-pilly bushes, I told them. Remember that we can't hear her side of the conversation, Oleander reminded me. Goldie probably can't relay what Ursula is saying to us right now, Athanasius said. She will have to tell us later. Oleander nodded. Of course. 
I was afraid I wouldn't see Ursula's ghost again, but she was standing by the lily-pilly bushes as we approached. She's here, I said to the others. Why am I still here? She asked me. How should I know? I asked her. Do I look like the Hollywood medium? Oleander elbowed me in the ribs. Honey catches more flies than vinegar. All right, I whispered to her. To Ursula Hackles, I said, you're still here because you haven't crossed over. Thanks for that, Sherlock, she snapped. I pursed my lips. Why do you think you're the only ghost here? Surely plenty of people from this establishment have died. You'll be trapped on this earthly plane until we solve your murder. I had no idea whether or not that was correct, but it suited my purpose to tell her so. I think you know who murdered you, or at least I think you have a clue. My words seemed to hit a nerve as the shimmering around her grew darker. I think Clara Swan knows something. What is it? She bit her lip. I don't want to go to hell, she said. Hell? Is there an echo here? She said. Why do you keep repeating everything I say? I only repeated it once, I retorted. Oleander elbowed me in the ribs again. I'm sure you won't go to hell if you have redemption, I said. You need to tell us where those keys are. The keys to the storage room where you locked all the residents' things. That should help keep you out of hell. Her expression sobered. Do you think so? I sighed. Put it this way, Ursula, if you're the one stopping the residents getting all their stuff back, then you'll go to hell, nothing surer. She pouted and seemed to be considering my words. Okay, then. There is a big rug in my room on the floor right beside my bed. If you pull it back, you'll find one of the boards will pop up. It's easy to find because the board has a knot in it. If you put your finger into the knot, you can lift the board out. That's where I kept my cash and my keys to the storage room. Is there any cash in there? I asked her. She nodded. Probably a bit over five thousand dollars. Five thousand dollars? Before she could make another remark about echoing, I pushed on. Do you want that to go to Theodora, or do you want it to be distributed amongst the residents to make up for what you did to them? I fixed her with a steely look. The residents, I suppose, she said angrily. She looked around her and then said, Isn't there supposed to be a white light or something? I shook my head. You've been watching too much TV. You won't cross over until we solve your murder. I've already told you that. Are you keeping anything from me? Did Clara know something about your murder? She shook her head. Of course not. Clara knows nothing. Look, Ursula, if you have any idea who murdered you, you need to tell me. I'm embarrassed about it, she said. Embarrassed about what? I asked her, puzzled. Embarrassed that you put milk powder into Harriet's food? Embarrassed that you sacked Julie Medina just out of spite? She winced as I spoke the words. Yes, I am embarrassed about that, to tell you the truth. Since I've been dead, I seem to be getting nicer. She pulled a face as if that was something dire. Is that why you wouldn't admit it to me? I asked her. She nodded slowly. I felt bad about it. Well, if you don't want to go to hell, then you really need to tell me who murdered you, I said. That's your best shot at staying out of hell. Are you just saying that? She asked me. I was just saying it, but didn't want her to know. I don't believe in hell, Athanasius said. I shushed him. It's best for us if she does, I whispered. What are you whispering about? Ursula asked me. Luckily for me, it appeared the ghost didn't have supernatural hearing. We were talking about hell, I told her truthfully. She clutched her head. All right, then, I'll tell you. I'll tell you who murdered me. It was all because of the blackmail. She looked as though she was about to burst into tears. What blackmail? I asked her. I was blackmailing someone. Without another word, she vanished. I turned around to see a nurse hurrying over to us. The residents want to know if you can bring your therapy wombat back now, she said. They're most disappointed because he's having such a long bathroom break. 
Okay, I'll take him back right now, I said. I hoped she would go away so I could speak to Ursula Hackles once more, but the nurse waited for me. I had no choice but to follow her. So Ursula Hackles was blackmailing someone, and that person had murdered her. If only she had said him or her, and not someone. I was entirely frustrated. Chapter 19 While Persnickel was being patted by all the residents, I filled in Oleander and Athanasius. If only that nurse hadn't come along at that very time, Athanasius said. Oleander agreed. And if only Ursula hadn't said someone, the gender would at least give us a clue. It was most disappointing, I said. In good news, at least we now know where the keys to the storage room are. That's all well and good, Athanasius said. But how on earth will we tell anyone? We can hardly go to one of the nurses and say that you're a sea witch, and your wombat, who is your familiar, enabled you to speak to the ghost of Ursula Hackles, who told you where she had hidden the keys to the storage room. I held up my hands. I see your point, now you put it like that. What can we do? Athanasius rubbed his forehead. We need to break into her apartment and fetch the keys ourselves, and then we can say we found the keys in the garden. What a good idea, Oleander said, but I wasn't so sure. Athanasius was on a roll. Yes, Goldie can take Persnickel for another bathroom break down the side of the building, and she can pretend she found the keys there. Better still, she can create a diversion. I was horrified. I can create a diversion? What sort of diversion? I really don't like the sound of this. I know, Oleander said cheerfully. You can pretend to faint. I'm not going to pretend to faint, I said in disgust. Do you know how far I'd have to fall from my stilettos? I'd do myself an injury. They weren't to be deterred. I think it's a brilliant idea, Athanasius said. Faint loudly. How can someone faint loudly? I said crossly. Are you two out of your minds? I could see their expressions were set. Okay, I'll agree to create a diversion, but I'm certainly not going to pretend to faint. You'll have to come up with a much better idea than that. Athanasius, what if you pretend to have a heart attack? Because they would stick all sorts of needles in me, he said as quick as a flash. I scratched my head. Oh, well, if I pretend to faint, will they stick needles in me? Oleander shook her head. No, because you're not a resident here. Does that mean you're reconsidering the fainting idea? Athanasius asked me. I thought about it for a minute. Couldn't we set something on fire instead? I asked hopefully. Athanasius and Oleander exchanged glances. Don't you want all those poor residents to get their possessions back? Oleander asked me. Do you realize that's emotional blackmail? I asked her. She nodded. Yes. Okay, I'll pretend to faint. I'm not happy about it, though. Athanasius beamed. I think you should do it as soon as possible, he said. Count to thirty slowly, and then pretend to faint. Oleander and I will head to Ursula's apartment now. How are you going to break in? I asked them. With the master key. That's why we need you to create a diversion, Athanasius explained patiently. Oleander and I will take the master key from the main nurse's station. Needless to say, it won't open the storage room. It only opens the door to everyone's apartment. I did not think this was going to go well, but I couldn't think of a better way to do it. I counted to thirty slowly, and because I was reluctant to pretend to faint, I ended up counting to fifty. I feel faint, I announced in a loud voice. Everyone looked at me, even Persnickel, but I assumed he did so because he thought he was getting a treat. I grabbed the table to break my fall. I flung the back of my hand over my face, as I had seen women do in old movies, and fell backwards to the ground. I was glad I was wearing a pencil skirt that went below my knees. I kept my eyes tightly shut, 
and I could hear the residents around me panicking. Help! We need a nurse! I heard them say. Presently, I heard a nurse speaking to me. Goldie, Goldie, are you all right? I thought I had better pretend to regain consciousness because I was concerned they might jab needles in me after all. I opened one eye. Yes, I said weakly. What happened? Where am I? I thought I was doing rather a good acting job. Two nurses helped me onto a chair while another nurse hurried to get me a glass of water. To my dismay, Henry Swan strode out towards me. What happened? He asked me. I fainted, I said, and the man called himself a doctor. What did he think happened? Are you pregnant? He asked me. I made a choking sound. Absolutely not. I rubbed the back of my neck. I think I was just stressed with everything that's happened since I moved here. Do you have a sore neck? He asked me. Sometimes pressure on someone's neck can make them faint. I jumped on the explanation. Yes, that's it. My neck was quite sore. I do a lot of typing in my profession. Henry's expression was stern. Fainting needs to be taken seriously. Oh, I think you should come by my office later. I'll send you to pathology for a blood test. I knew needles would be involved. I was afraid of needles. I don't want a blood test, I said in a scared voice. And an x-ray of your neck, too, he said. You really need to take this seriously, Goldie. I nodded. Sure. Henry was still speaking. It could be liver failure, kidney disease, heart problems, any manner of things. Gee, thanks for the cheerful words, I said. The residents and nurses were all crowded around me, staring at me. Are you sure you're all right? One of the nurses asked me. I was until he mentioned liver and kidney failure. I glared at Henry. I'm only stating facts, he said. I want you to come to my office, Goldie. I'd like to take your blood pressure. That's not going to happen, I said firmly. He looked rather put out. All right, then, but I'd like you to come by my office later. Sure, sure, I said. He stood there looking at me for a moment and then patted my hand before leaving. How was I going to get out of going to his office? I would have to come up with something later. The nurses fussed over me for a few moments, but I assured them I was okay. I'm sure it's the heat, I said, fanning myself with a nearby napkin. I'm not used to this Queensland heat. I am from Melbourne, after all. That's probably it, one of the nurses said. Do you drink enough water? I shook my head. No, I haven't had any water since I got here. Well, that's it, the nurse said. Don't you worry yourself about liver failure and kidney disease. Just make sure you drink a lot of water. I thanked her. Just then, Athanasius and Oleander showed up. I think I'll take Persnickel for another bathroom break now, I said. One of the nurses made to stop me. I think you should sit a little longer. I'm perfectly fine, I said. If I feel faint again, I'll sit down. Oleander took me by the arm, and we walked down the side of the building to the lily pillies outside Ursula Hackle's old office. Did you get the keys? I hissed. Yes, your diversion worked perfectly, Athanasius said. It got me a doctor's appointment with Henry. That's what it got me, I snapped. And he wants to send me for a pathology test. What am I going to do? Simply fail to show up, of course, Athanasius said. What's the worst that could happen? Tell him you went to your room, doctor. What a great idea. I didn't think of that. Athanasius looked pleased. Did you get the money? We did, indeed. And we have discussed what we'll do with it, Oleander said. Athanasius is going to pretend he won some money in the lottery, and then he'll distribute it to everyone at the retirement home. Good, I said, much better than the fainting idea. It worked, didn't it? Oleander said. Now, Goldie, since you're clearly such a good actress, you can pretend you found the keys under the lily pilly bushes. She looked around her and then surreptitiously threw the keys. How are you feeling now, Goldie? One of the nurses said 
when we had walked back to where the residents were sitting. I'm feeling much better now, I said. I think you were right about the water. Since I drank the water just then, I'm feeling much better. Anyway, has anyone lost a set of keys? I jangled the keys. A collective gasp went up from all the residents. I think they could be Ursula Hackle's keys, the nurse said. Where did you find them? They were directly outside Ursula Hackle's office, Oleander said. Persnickel was looking in the bushes and dislodged a stone in the garden. She must have kept them hidden under the stone. The nurses nodded. That's why we couldn't find them, one of the nurses said. We've been searching for those keys without any luck. Julie Medina appeared. Don't tell me you have Ursula Hackle's keys. Let's see if they work. We all followed her down to the storage room. I thought she would say that Persnickel wasn't allowed in the building, but she didn't say a word about him. The first key she tried worked, and the residents let out shrieks of delight. Julie swung the door open and gasped. I looked past her. Inside was all manner of precious possessions, phones, soft toys, cute little cushions, knitting needles, games of backgammon, black and white photographs of Cary Grant, pressed flowers and old paperback novels. Julie turned around and held up one hand. Everyone line up and then you can all go in one by one and find your possessions. She enveloped me in a warm hug. I couldn't remember when I had last been hugged. I patted her back awkwardly. Thank you, she said. It means so much to the residents. I could see she genuinely cared for the residents, and I warmed to her. I hoped she wasn't the murderer. Yet if Julie wasn't the murderer, who was it? Henry? Theodora? Harriet? Was Julie having a secret relationship with Henry? And if that wasn't her secret, what was it? I decided to show up to Henry's office and ask some hard questions. I don't think this is such a good idea, Oleander said when we were sitting in her apartment half an hour later. Athanasius nodded. I agree with Oleander. But you didn't mind when I went to the Country Women's Association and pumped Theodora Forbes for information? Or when I went to Clara Swan and got information from her? And Athanasius, you are the one who dragged me to Julie's house to look through her windows. What if her mother had been in there and had a rifle? That was hardly likely, Athanasius said, but I held up a hand. I've heard about all the guns in the country. Every farmer has at least one rifle. That's common knowledge, even for a city girl like I am. I should come with you, Oleander said. I've been thinking about how my fingerprints managed to get on the codeine packet. Henry did drop a lot of medications right in front of me the night before Ursula Hackles died. I picked them up for him as he was on the phone and it sounded urgent. My prints would have been all over those medications. Why didn't you mention this before? Athanasius asked her. Did you tell the police? She shook her head. No, because it didn't seem important. I figured it couldn't be staged. Now I'm beginning to wonder. Goldie, I really think I should come with you. I'm not a child, I said. Henry will think it's highly suspicious if I take someone else to my doctor's appointment. But you're only going to get a referral for an X-ray and pathology tests, Oleander said. I nodded. Exactly, and I'll be perfectly safe going alone. If he is the murderer, then he can hardly murder me there. There would be other people in the waiting room, and his receptionist will be there. Athanasius crossed his arms over his chest. At five? I thought most doctor's offices closed at five. What if he made your appointment at that time simply so he can murder you? I chuckled. For a start, it was short notice, so he fitted me in after hours. A receptionist or a nurse or someone will surely still be there. And besides, it's common knowledge that I'm going there. If he murders me, then everyone will know he did it. They still looked doubtful. I suppose, Oleander said grudgingly, I just don't have a good feeling about it. Neither do I, Athanasius said. Should we go with you and wait in your car? I waved a hand at them. 
I'll be perfectly safe. This is far safer than crawling through the mangrove swamp or looking through Julie's windows when we didn't know what was in there. They protested, but I remained unmoved. No one stopped me once I had made up my mind to do something. Finally, I said, if I don't contact you by six, then you can call the police. It might be too late by then. Oleander pulled a face. Despite my confidence earlier in the day, by the time I got to Henry's office at five, I had butterflies in my stomach. Was Henry the murderer? Still, even if he was, he surely wouldn't murder me for asking some questions. At least, not on the spot. I figured the worst case scenario was that if he was the murderer, then he would come for me later, and by that time, I would have let Detective Max Grayson in on it. I would just have to make sure that Henry didn't give me any needles. I sat in my car in the parking area for a while and then went in. The automatic glass doors opened and I walked up to the desk. To my dismay, there wasn't a receptionist or a nurse in sight. Henry stuck his head out a door. Goldie, is that you? I thought I heard someone. Come in. I thought there'd be a receptionist here, or someone, I said. He shook his head. She always goes at five, and I've had to fit you in. I'll just write you out a couple of referrals. It won't take long. He beckoned me into his office. He seemed to be in a hurry, so I knew I'd have to ask my questions quickly. I forgot something earlier today, he quirked one eyebrow. Sorry, I started again. Remember that you asked me what your mother told me? And you said she told you all about the situation with her will. I nodded. She also said something else. His pen stopped in midair, hovering over the form. What was that? Was it my imagination, or had the air in the room suddenly turned chilly? I didn't want to tell you, because I didn't know if it was true. I didn't want you to think I thought your mother was gossiping. He set down the pen with a thud. What was that? Your mother said that Ursula confided in her that she was blackmailing someone. He picked up the pen and twiddled it between his fingers. That's interesting. Did she say who it was? I shook my head. No, I don't think she knew. I wondered if he believed the outrageous lie, but I could hardly tell him that I could speak to ghosts in the presence of my familiar. So my mother has no idea who Ursula was blackmailing? His tone was not menacing, but for some reason I felt threatened. No, she didn't. She only said it in passing. That's why I didn't mention it this morning. He continued to look at me, but then he returned to filling out the form. My mother's on a lot of medication that affects her mind, and from time to time she comes up with fanciful stories, he said. For some reason I felt he was lying. She also told me that Julie Medina's mother isn't living with her. Of course, she hadn't told me that, but I wanted to draw him out. He jerked upright. She didn't. I nodded slowly. Yes. She said that Julie Medina is having an affair with someone and that she is using her ailing mother as an excuse. Did she say who Julie was having an affair with? He put the pen down and stood up. At that point, I realized how foolish I had been. His office was in a remote location down the end of a lane and with only retail shops that all shut at five in the same street. I didn't know whether to make a run for it or whether to try to bluff my way out of it and pretend I knew no more. A crack of thunder outside made me jump. If I made a run for it, I wouldn't get far in my stilettos, so I reached down and slipped them off. I need to know exactly what my mother told you, he said, sitting on the edge of his desk. He was now only a short distance from me. If he was the murderer, I didn't want him to take it out on his mother, but then I couldn't tell him the truth. I decided to lie. Well, it's a bit embarrassing, but she thinks you're the murderer, I said. She thinks Ursula Hackles was blackmailing you. She thinks you're having an affair with Julie Medina, 
and you don't want to tell her because she'll make sure you're never in her will. I thought he would laugh it off and say his mother's medication was to blame, but he snapped at me. Okay, so you know, let's just come straight to the point. What do you want? Money? Are you going to blackmail me too? He was still sitting on the edge of his desk. I was sitting on the chair, clutching my handbag and my stilettos. There was such a loud crack of thunder that the building reverberated. I thought it was your mother's medication speaking, I said. He laughed, a harsh, guttural laugh. He looked menacing, a silhouette against an intense flash of lightning. It's a bit late for that, Goldie. You have shown your hand. Ursula blackmailed me for some time. What? I said. She blackmailed you because she knew you were having an affair with Julie? Henry's eyes widened. Of course not. Ursula was blackmailing me because my silly mother told her all about my criminal activities. Criminal activities? I echoed. I had no idea. So you were just going to blackmail me for having an affair with Julie? He laughed. You have no idea who you're dealing with. I'm the biggest distributor of ice on the North Gold Coast, and my silly mother told Ursula Hackles. I was intrigued, in spite of my dangerous situation. How does your mother know about your criminal activities? I asked him. Because she bankrolls them, of course, he said. She might be over 90, but she's still a very good businesswoman. Being elderly is a good cover. I was puzzled. But she is elderly, I said. He waved a finger at me. Exactly. I wanted to stall for time. How did you get Oleander's fingerprints on the packet of codeine? He crossed his arms and leant forward. His scent of sandalwood and vanilla wafted towards me. I recognized other notes in there. Vetiver, Lang Lang, and Heliotrope as well as Lily of the Valley, he was wearing Clive Christian number one. I should have known he gained money by nefarious means. No doctor in a small country town could afford that perfume. It was easy. His voice took on a self-satisfied tone. I heard Oleander argue with Ursula, so I decided to set her up. I had already put the codeine in Ursula's meal after the kitchen staff put it in the refrigerator. I dropped a stack of medications from a plastic bag right in front of Oleander. She put them back in the bag for me while I pretended to speak on my phone about an emergency. There was only one packet of codeine, so I figured she wouldn't remember it amongst all the others. And she didn't, as it turns out. I jumped as there was another crack of thunder. And now I'm going to have to deal with you, too. He lunged at me then, his hands reaching for my throat. I screamed, and he landed heavily on top of me, his hands closing around my neck. He made a strange sound like someone in pain, but I figured he was enraged. I felt nothing. Was I already dead? Had my death been so fast that I didn't feel anything? All I could feel was his weight on top of me. I opened my eyes. It seemed I was still alive, but he wasn't strangling me. It was only when I managed to push him off me that I saw that my five-inch stilettos were impaled in his stomach. I was pulling out my phone to call the police when Max Grayson burst through the door with a gun. He confessed everything to me and then tried to kill me, I said shakily. I'd already taken off my shoes so I could make a run for it, and when he leapt on me, he was impaled. I stopped to draw breath. Max averted his eyes from Henry writhing on the floor. An ambulance is on its way, he told me. Goldie, are you all right? I nodded, or maybe I was shaking. Don't mention the gun when the police get here, he said. I'm not supposed to carry one when I'm on leave. I won't mention your gun if you don't mention my coffee machine, I said, and then burst into tears. Hey, Max said, come on, let's go outside. I let Max lead me out of the sterile-smelling office and into the fresh air, where we walked away from the building. Not too far, but far enough to enjoy the smell of the salt water. Better? 
he asked, but I couldn't speak. It felt as though someone was standing on my chest. Max pulled me into his arms. He looked good. I knew I shouldn't have been thinking about how good he looked, but in my defence he looked really good. The off-duty police officer aesthetic, with its five o'clock stubble and gorgeous jacket, worked for him and for me. How about now? he asked. I did feel better. Something about being in his arms made me feel safe. He smelt like clean laundry and sandalwood. He pressed his face into my hair and I smiled. Then the police car pulled up and he took a step back. I stood there watching as he directed the police officers. He looked so dashing and in control, informing the officers what had happened with Henry. He came over to tell me he had to go to the station, but before he left, he put his jacket around my shoulders and squeezed my arm. You do not have a crush on Detective Max Grayson, I told myself. You have just been through a traumatic event, and Max has strong arms and green-grey eyes, but that does not mean anything. Even though I told myself that, I didn't know if it was true, and whether I was just drooling over Max because I was shaken up. I only knew one thing for sure. I needed a drink. Fast. Chapter 20 I knew you were in trouble when the thunderstorm came out of nowhere, Oleander whispered to me. I called Max and told him you were at Henry's and that we thought Henry was the murderer. I decided to invite everyone over for a coffee party to celebrate the fact that Oleander was off the hook and that Henry Swan had been arrested for Ursula Hackle's murder. It was a beautiful morning, which meant I had thrown open all the doors and windows to let the scent of lavender drift in on the warm sea breeze. Oleander and I were in the kitchen chatting away. She told me how worried Max had been, and I couldn't help but feel butterflies in my stomach. Max was also there. Oleander had invited him, and I wasn't sure how I felt about that. I was a little embarrassed about sobbing all over him the previous day, and my embarrassment only grew when he knocked on my door. I'd blushed and let him in. Harriet was there too, celebrating the fact that she was no longer considered a suspect. I don't think the police ever did consider her seriously, but then again, she was convinced they had. I had finally made everyone's coffee, and this time I had given Max black coffee just the way he liked it, when there were five brisk knocks on the front door. Through the glass door, I could make out the shapes of two men. Athanasius looked out the window and then turned to me. Oh no, I do believe those detectives are here. We all looked at each other. The coffee machine, Max said. I'll take care of it, I hissed. Everyone, hide your coffee. Oleander, you let them in. I sprinted to my coffee machine, on my way to the kitchen grabbing one of the throw rugs I had put over one of the old sofas to disguise its hideousness. I flung it over the coffee machine and hoped like crazy it wouldn't heat to the degree that it caught on fire. I dumped some packets of pasta and rice on the top and added a loaf of bread for good measure. Sure, the detectives would know it was a coffee machine if they lifted up the throw rug, but if they didn't, I should be fine. As I raced back into the living room, the detectives walked through the door. Ms. Bloom, sorry to intrude, the younger one said. That's fine, I said. What can I do for you? We wanted to inform you that Henry Swan has made a full confession, the older one said. I smiled. Thanks for telling me. Will I get my shoes back? The younger one nodded. Yes, after the sentencing. Dr. Swan's confession means you won't have to give your testimony in a long, drawn-out criminal trial. That's good news, I said. I was hoping they would leave. The older one sniffed the air. What's that smell? I don't know, I said. I do have scented candles burning. It smells suspiciously like coffee, he wrinkled his nose. We all know coffee is illegal in this town. I crossed my arms over my chest and surreptitiously glanced around the room. We've had a nice cup of tea. I looked at the empty cups and then at the potted plants. 
I hoped caffeine didn't hurt indoor plants, because I'm sure that's where most of the coffee had ended up. It was then I saw Harriet's full coffee cup on the ground. She was the furthest from a potted plant, so she must have thought putting her coffee cup on the ground was the only way to hide it. The young detective followed my gaze. Is that coffee? he asked in an accusing tone. He pointed to the cup. It's tea, Harriet said in a small voice, but the detectives strode towards the cup. I held my breath. Just then, Persnickel appeared, awoken from his sleep. He spied the coffee cup after the detectives did, but he made it there first. There was a dreadful sucking sound, and suddenly the cup was dry. My wombat likes tea, I said. Max stood up and walked over to them. I thought you would have stopped falsely accusing people by now, detectives. Oleander crossed to my side and nodded. The detectives flushed red. Of course, the youngest one said. They muttered their goodbyes and then left. I bolted the door behind them. I hope Persnickel's all right after drinking that hot coffee, I said. Where is he? He ran from the room, Harriet said. I'm so sorry, Goldie. I thought that was a good place to hide the coffee. I had no idea Persnickel would drink it. It's just that I didn't have anywhere to throw it out. That's fine, I said. I thought Harriet was exaggerating when she said Persnickel ran from the room, but then he came back. He torpedoed around the room. I didn't even know wombats could move that fast. He leapt in the air, did a few laps of the room, and then took off. I don't think caffeine is good for wombats, Athanasius said in what was clearly an enormous understatement. I'll have to make coffee for everyone again. I trudged back into the kitchen, nearly tripping over Persnickel, who was sprinting past me once more. I reached for the grinder, when Max put his hand over mine. Go on, Goldie, go and sit down. I'll make the coffee for everyone. Are you sure? I asked him. He nodded. I went back to sit on one of my uncle's old sofas, and then lay back in my seat, closing my eyes and reflecting on the past week. Life had been so hectic since I moved to East Bucklebury. If things remained as exciting as they had been since I arrived in town, then my life was surely going to change. And I was certain it would change for the better. The End You've just listened to Broom with a View, Sea Witch Cozy Mysteries, Book 2, written by Morgana Best, narrated by Amy Soakes. Copyright 2020 by Morgana Best. Production Copyright 2021 by Morgana Best. If you've enjoyed this audiobook, please consider leaving a review and recommending on social media or directly to friends and family and keep an eye out for other audiobooks by Morgana Best. Thanks for listening.